What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. In 1906, British archaeologist Arl Stein set out on an expedition to Central Asia. His mission was to find treasures of the greatest lost civilization mankind has ever known. Upon arriving in the city of Dunghuang, he encountered a Buddhist monk who had told him that he had discovered a secret library known as the Cave of a Thousand Buddhas. Mm. Okay? In that library, he found these manuscripts from all over the world, from different like Hindu texts and all these things, but one of them had an ancient map in it. And the map depicted Atlantis as a region that existed from west of the Pillars of Hercules as a region, all the way to the Yucatan. And that means that those ruins off of Cuba are part of Atlantis. <laughs> Croy, you are a hard man to get in touch with, but everyone was requesting you all winter, and I'm glad to have you here, brother. Hey, I'm glad we're finally sitting down to have this amazing conversation. We talked on the phone, and it sounded like we had a lot of excitement to change history here. Changing history. thats You were saying that in the car yesterday, too. That's always like the aggressive way to go about it, but for what you look at, that's kind of exactly what you know, your field is, is looking to do because history is just what we've been told. And when you can find evidence of things that perhaps we haven't considered before, I mean, that quite literally is the definition of it, is it not? Yeah. And I think in this example, it's not just about changing the paradigm that a lot of other individual, individual, individuals like Graham Hancock and Randall and Robert Schock and Robert Paval, they're all doing this this paradigm sh shift that is important. It's its us understanding that, look, there's another chapter of human civilizations that came before the Ice Age, known as the Younger Dryas, which is approximately around 11,600 years ago or so. For people who don't, who yes. aren't familiar with that, can you just explain the full context there? Absolutely. So the first thing to understand is that in our history books and through mainstream archaeologists and any time you want to try to understand history, we're told through this lens that civilizations emerged 6,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent, which is the Iraqi area today. Mm. And that since then, every single ancient ruin, every structure, any writing, doesn't matter, anywhere in the world fits into that time period. So between 6,000 years and our current time period, all of human civilization in terms of civilization rising, not nomadic hunter-gatherers, is supposedly in that window. Mm. The problem is that we're finding evidence all around the world that that's not accurate. And that what we're seeing is that, yes, there was an emergence of civilization 6,000 years ago in Sumer, but that's only another iteration from previous civilizations that had already been there and other parts of the world. And I want that to be the message that maybe perhaps is echoed more than anything else in this entire conversation, is that nearly everywhere, and I wanna say that again, nearly everywhere, we find ancient megalithic, meaning large stones, very high precision quality work. We find evidence that a later culture had found that and built on top of it. So it's not like we ever find something that's just sitting in the middle of nowhere and no one's ever paid attention to it. It seems as though even those civilizations within that 6,000 year window still knew about their past a little bit. They still knew about the connections of these civilizations that were once there. And they, they took it under great uh, importance to go and then show, um, show the importance of those sites through worship and through building mm. in these locations. I mean, if you're a group that only has so many resources and so many things, to go to these great lengths to find these places and then build on top of them shows that they valued that to basically the highest degree. And, but why? Mm. Well, it's because it was part of a lost chapter of our history where those people were different than the groups that came later. They were a lot smarter. They were different in a lot of ways, and we're going to go over some of that. But bringing it back to what we said at the very beginning, I made this statement that I know is a very, um, it's a very direct and very big statement to make, that we're going to change history. What I meant by that is not just acknowledging the work of all these other individuals as well as myself to say, look, it's not just a 6,000-year window of civilization, 
but there was a civilization before the Ice Age, before mm. 12,000 years ago, that was the one that was the advanced one, it was the one that built all these incredible things that we're about to talk about. More advanced than we are. More advanced in some ways. Not mm. more advanced in cell phones and computers, but more advanced in their understanding of the cosmos, consciousness, energy, you know, the, this important concept, the hermetic law of as above, so below, the law of correspondence. They understand that, they understood that to such degree that, for instance, something like the Great Pyramids of Giza, they, they aligned those to the three belt stars of Orion, but not mm. just there. In Teotihuacan, across the entire world in Mexico, they did the same thing. You see the Temple of the Sun, Temple of the Moon, and Temple of Quetzalcoatl. It's the same alignment as those stars like in Egypt. You're seeing parallels, parallels across the entire world of the same thing. But that's not, even that is not what I mean by that statement about changing history. There's already a lot of us doing that. What I mean by changing history is how about proving that not only was there a civilization that was advanced before the Ice Age, but what if there were multiple civilizations be even before that that have come and gone? And what if we can connect the entire narrative, not only ancient Sumer and not only Peru and Egypt, but what if we can connect Atlantis and connect the ancient Athenian civilization, the pre-Greeks, and then mm. connect every other megalithic advanced civilization around the world to a specific location that is just being excavated right now? And that is what's so exciting. So when I say that statement, I believe this research is so cutting edge that we are literally about to change all of history. It's a hell of an opener, man. I'm pumped. I, got, I got goosebumps on my skin right now. How did Before we like get into all the details, though, how did you get into this stuff? You've been doing this for, what, like a decade now? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think the best, place, best way to answer that would be to say that I was a weird kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was a kid that other kids were like just I think they felt uncomfortable around me. I was a, mm. I was a weird kid. I really was. I was a kid that instead of playing on with toys, I'd be walking around the playground looking around rocks and crystals and trying to find stuff. Mm, you were one of those. I was I was like I didn't really like I, I was sort of a loner. Mm. I didn't feel like anyone could understand me. I was always asking questions about the stars and about uh, the earth. And I remember I remember being like. Um, eight years old or nine years old or, and asking another kid being like, Hey, did you know that we're on a planet that's flying through space? And that if you look up there, you're looking at a, a basically a, an entire star that's shining and giving us light. I remember kids being like, what? Yeah. Like they didn't understand. I, and I felt like I was never understood. Did you ever, did you go through a period where you lost that a little bit? And didn't yeah. ask those questions. I think that's a pretty common thing. I didn't totally lose it, but I think you look at the education system, and like you and I were talking about last night with the whole Carl Sagan discussing how kids hit a certain age. What was that? Three with third grade or something? And maybe it was like kindergarten right? or something. And yeah. because of the way that things are designed, imagination and thinking outside the box, and all those mm -hmm. questions, like that's really not promoted, or in, in many ways, it's almost scolded in some people. Yes, I remember being in class and asking a lot of questions and having the teacher eventually like be quiet or just like <laughs> stop asking questions. And so part of it started to, like you said, it deludes a little bit, right? You're like, what am I doing? Like, am I we like the one that's really weird and I should be more like them. And, but eventually I, I really never conformed to that. And instead of, instead I just started going out in the wilds and like hiking and going out into nature. And I didn't, um, I just sort of ran away from the world is the best way to describe it. Mm. And I think a lot of people listening to this uh, that will probably relate to that Sure, is, is having difficulty and you almost, there's this core inside you that doesn't want to conform. You're no matter what happens, it's like there's something inside us. Some of us are very, very strong with that. And I never did, but because of that, I didn't have very many friends, but to make a long story short, it set me up for this place of, being a very inquisitive person and wanting to know more. But I remember at the core of that, I was always incredibly fascinated with like almost an obsession, even at a young age, and I had no idea why, the idea of a lost civilization. Something even shown like in a silly concept like in Jungle Book, right? Mm. Disney movie. But you're a kid, you're watching it. Remember in Jungle Book, he finds this ancient temple that is ruled over by like orangutans. Yeah. Right? And they're, and they're, but there's no humans left. It's like the remnants of it and it's all overgrown in the jungle. I remember being a kid and being like, oh my God, why, do, why is that so amazing to me? 
And it wasn't until movies like Stargate came along that Stargate? totally. Stargate? I don't think I'm familiar Stargate with Stargate is, for anyone who hasn't seen Stargate, not the TV show, but the actual original movie, it's just one of the best movies ever made, in my opinion. Mm. It's a movie about an ancient, ancient culture that had some kind of a Stargate type of material that was found and it was determined to be a gateway to like another star system. Um, great movie. But the, the point was these little things kept coming in my life that made me start questioning and wondering about things. And it wasn't until reading the serious mystery with Robert Temple with the Dogon and their, Oh, this is what you were talking about yeah, last night. The, yeah. And their understanding of like details of the serious, serious star, a, B and C and the Canis major and all the orbital tracks of everything. And, how they said they were influenced by all these things, but they're like this remote tribe in the middle of Mali, Africa. How could they know any of that before telescopes were invented? Can you explain them sure. and that whole thing? Because that blew my mind. Yeah, last I'll night. give this. This was the one where you were talking about they put one elder in the cave and everything, yeah. right? Yeah. This is wild. This, I guess it's important because this is what was my spark. People talk about what is that spark that sends you off on a completely different path in life sure. where you start then questioning everything else. And it was, I was primed for that moment because when I read that book, um, it's one of those moments where you, you sit it down and you just sort of stare up and you're like, what the hell? Like, cause then all of a sudden your brain has to reformat. It's a lot harder than people I think just think it is mm. when you're taught everything in your life about everything in a certain way and your teach teachers and your parents to change a paradigm of our entire history, who we are, in, influence potentially the stars, that's a big shift because it shifts your whole brain to different thinking. And that shift came with the story of the Dogon. And what the story is, if, if those aren't familiar with it, it's one of those things that is impossible to um, truly refute. And mm. I think that's why it's so powerful. The story is that there's a tribe in Mali, Africa, Western Africa, very remote region, that had never been visited by the outside world. And there was um, originally one, but eventually became two French anthropologists in the 1930s were fascinated by this tribe. They went met them. But what they were so fascinated by was that the, tr the tribe had all these incredible stories of their heritage and their history that they wouldn't tell him. This is what I didn't mention to you last night. That's so fascinating is that he's he wanted to know this incredible history because they had they had drawn in the sand like orbital tracks of stars and stuff and things that they should not have known because the telescope hadn't been invented. They knew about Sirius, the star, Sirius A, but B and C. B hadn't even been discovered yet by radio telescope. Once B was discovered, they were like, wait, so the Dogen already knew about that before they even had telescopes. But they also say there's a, there's a star called Sirius C that we haven't even discovered yet. Mm. Okay, so the point was, they knew incredible amounts of information, not just about the Sirius star system, but about our Earth, about the energy of it, about um, the source God. So this French anthropologist is forced to stay with them for 10 years, live with them for 10 years because they wouldn't tell him, they didn't trust him. So, he's, so they forced him to stay No, there. he, but if he wanted to know... He had he had oh, to stay. So saying. they didn't make him. They didn't say he yes. can't leave. Yes. But he he wanted to know. So in order for them to tell him, he was he had to stay with the culture to gain their trust for ten years. Mm. The reason for that was that the Dogon had such profound information about their history that they felt that the only way to not have that message be polluted was they would have an elder of the community be decided, and then a secondary elder that could communicate with them, and they would isolate themselves in a cave completely outside, uh, isolated from the outside world. The elder who was the never elder, allowed yes. out. It's like a life sentence. But he's the only one who knew the entire history. And they did that because they recognized just like the game of phone when you're a kid, right? You're on the, you have that game with yeah. a circle of kids yeah. and you're like, hey, uh, the elephant went to the store. And then by the time you get around, it's yes. like something completely different. Oh, that's not a children's game. That is a <laughs> real life, like we see that every fucking, just go on Twitter, Christ. <laughs> One tweet twain, changes to the other, next thing you know, yeah. it's like, well, how did this even start? So this elder, they know that, and this elder is kept to preserve. And it's, I only scratched the surface of what they knew. I encourage people to go read the serious mystery, the things they knew about our solar system and about earth and about even the stars is, is, is mind boggling, right? 
So he stays there for 10 years. They tell him the whole thing, finally. And to, to be clear real yeah. fast, how many people told him? Because the full history is only known by the elder. He eventually gained the trust of that elder. In the cave. Yes. That's why it took him 10 years. So why did they let in... This is what I don't understand. Why did they let an outsider become the intermediary, the intermediary when... They had spent all these years specifically saying there was only going to be the elder and then the person, I guess, who's going to take the torch eventually, who is the intermediary. Because they realized that he, that he was this genuine researcher scientist who wanted to document it right, like the, the right way. And it led to an entire book and, and bringing recognition to the Dogon for what they are and what they're doing. And it took 10 years because they wanted to trust that I mean, that's a long time. That's yes. not like a short no, time. You're right. Yes. And so eventually they did tell him their entire story. And he took it back and wrote all of it down and kind of blew up the academic world. Now, how and what year was that again? This is like 1931 to 1940. Okay. On July 17th, 2014, Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 took off from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Less than three hours later, the flight had disappeared. Soon thereafter, a debris field was spotted in eastern Ukraine. All 298 people on board were dead. Now, in some ways, you might think this crash was just a tragic accident, but the timing of when it happened and where it happened was not random. You may remember that this was months after Russia had forcibly annexed the Crimean Peninsula in Ukraine, and also when the war in the Donbass, the eastern region of Ukraine, was well underway, which is something we know all too well about today. So, in the days, weeks, and months after the disaster, finger pointing was abound. Back in America, former NASA scientist Harleen Carr was trying to follow the news on the ground to figure out what the hell had happened. See, after Harleen had left NASA, she was at a company that had built the engines that were on this very jet. So, of course, she had a reason to want to figure out if it had been something wrong with the engines. To her frustration, though, misinformation was flying around left and right. Whether it was false narratives or conflicting reports, no one could figure out what the hell was going on. If you remember this story, it was pretty wild. But it was at this moment that Harleen decided she needed to do something about it. So fast forward to 2023, and her company, Ground News, is now five years old. Guys, the link for this is in the description below, and you are going to want to check it out. Why? Let me explain. What this website does is it pulls news stories from around the internet and uses a proprietary data scanner to sign a numerical value of what their political leaning is. In English, it essentially bakes in the bias for you so that you know exactly what you're reading. And the site also does all kinds of other things with this information, including having a section that shows all the stories that the left and right are ignoring, respectively, for that day. So guys, I want you to check out my personal link in the description below and sign up for the site. It is ground.news forward slash Julian Dory. And I say this not just because it quite literally supports the show, but because you're going to love this tool. Now click that link below and let me know what you think. So what sources did they cite within their culture? Like how did they, yeah, was it, was it, yeah. was it just, oh, this has been passed down to an elder in the cave over and over. So that's how we know it's, it's the truth. Or did they say specifically like this elder was, you know, generations yeah. ago was around for X, Y, or Z and here's how we know it. Right. So that's, that's actually, they have a very specific point about how they say they got knowledge and where mm. they, first of all, the history of the Dogon is unusual because they came from Africa. They actually were originally part of um, the ancient African Egyptian um, area and they left because of religious prosecution and then it ended up ended up in Mali which is sort of strange on its own because we're gonna see other other uh, comparisons and connections through that part of Africa with parts of like the Olmec in Mexico in Veracruz which is very unusual which shows that they've likely made it mm. anyway what they state is that they learned everything from a, a great traveling being a great sage that was known as Awanus in ancient Sumer. And it's they, depi they depicted it as like an aquatic being, which I think was purely symbolic. Because when you go to Sumer and you learn about the great sages like Adapa and the Apkalu, they use symbolism to describe them in a way of what their mentality, what their purpose, a lot of different aspects of them. And you find that there was an ancient Sumerian god who is the heart of their entire civilization known as Enki. And he's supposed to be the god of fresh water and the god of the oceans. Can you go back for a minute for people who sure. aren't familiar right now? And I do want to say, for, for those who are listening today 
who are deep on ancient civilizations and know the history well. I apologize if we go back to do some stuff that may be basic for you, but there's a lot of people listening. Yeah. You and I talked about this before. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people listening who are unfamiliar with some of these civilizations or all of it, and we need to make sure we have the context great. defined correctly so that That's we can great. move forward. What, it, what this is coming down to is that I do believe that Sumer in the area of Iraq is where civilization began. But it's not when we told it. It's, we're, we're, it's not when we're told it began. Mm. I believe that civilizations there are much, much older than even even younger Dryas Ice Age. I believe they may be as old as fifty thousand years what old. What makes you think that? What we're about to go over with evidence showing the different iterations of those civilizations which proves that they're from these different time periods. And I just want to give one example. Sure. There is an ancient tablet called the Legend of Atana. And Atana, E-T-A-N-A, -A, Atana was an ancient king of one of these cities called Kish. What's fascinating, though, is in that tablet, it opens up by discussing how there was a great catastrophe on the earth and that basically all of civilization was destroyed and that it had to be re-lowered again. Kingship had to be re-lowered again, like civilization to be recreated mm -hmm. in this new world at Kish. Kish is part of this Sumerian region of Iraq. So it's telling you right there, look, we had these ancient, ancient cities that were created here. A catastrophe came through, destroyed them, and then, they, and then another civilization emerged after. But, and that's a core concept that I want to be echoed through this entire conversation. I want to mention that again. Because in Sumer, you find out that there are what these call great sages. And There's, I'm going to put a picture in the corner of the screen great. for people to follow this, by the way. There, throughout the ancient world, especially Sumer, we find this overlapping theme everywhere, shown in literally depictions of rock reliefs in ancient texts everywhere, of this idea of a great powerful being, like a very, very smart, beyond anyone around them, who travels with a group around the world and creates civilizations. Mm. It's shown literally throughout countless texts. What what's connects this to the Dogon that's so strange is that the Dogon state that there was a being known as, the, connected to Awanis and Sumer, the same depiction, same everything, that is the one that told them everything, is the mm. one that, that, where they got all the knowledge so from. there's got it, okay. So it's some, this, these ancient sage from Sumer made it to Mali, Africa. But is that the only place they made it to? No. That's only one of many, many, many. Well, how I don't I may be way off base yeah. asking this. Yeah. But you had mentioned a few minutes ago that, that we're talking about multi civilizations, meaning like a bunch of younger driest periods where this could have emanated yes. from before. Yes. So could this perhaps go far enough back that we're talking about like Pangea, where every where all the land was together and that's I don't, how? I don't believe it's anywhere near that far back. Okay. I think we need to like we we'll, we should just briefly review ge geologic history. Sure. Let's do um, it. Pangea, we're talking millions and millions and millions of years ago. What I'm looking at here, and even though it totally scares the mainstream academics and blows open the timeline of what we think, I do believe that everything I've studied and I've been putting together a timeline of all the tablets and all the archaeological evidence that our story, instead of being 6,000 years old, and I'm talking civilization, not like hunter-gatherer stuff, mm. our story emerging like civilization emerging i believe is more like two hundred thousand years old 200 that no that's a lot yeah so because the younger dryas was twelve thousand five hundred. that's years what ago, i'm no? saying is is i've been uncovering evidence from looking at ice cores from antarctica as well as greenland that what we're looking at is not simply one event that occurred around thirteen thousand years ago but a cyclical nature of events that happens perhaps every 13 Every 20, every 50, we don't know exactly the cycles. Because like, like I was talking to Randall Carlson the other day, we had this great conversation where I said, Randall, it seems more like it's cycles within cycles than a cycle. He goes, mm. that's exactly what I've found as well. So, but does that mean, because the way I've always understood it, and maybe I'm fucked up here, but like the whole idea of like the younger Dryas is that you had the earth heat up and kill everything and then suddenly instantly like freeze over, meaning nothing survives. But what you seem to, and again, maybe I'm missing it, yeah. what you seem to be saying is that something, some people do survive. Yeah, it's, it's, the extremes of it cannot be underestimated. 
so I do want to reiterate that like Randall talks about, we're looking at events that are awesome. Like he says yes. that are beyond our comprehension. And I agree, but we're also talking about a civilization and people that were way more sophisticated in their understanding than we are. They, they were mapping the cosmos. They were tracking cycles based on the precession of the equinox of our earth and tracking how we face different constellations known as the Zodiac. And how mm. if you tra track ages, you can figure out when things are going to happen. They knew all of that. They knew about these events. That's why they created the most elaborate group of underground cities in the world. From Derinkuyu, Turkey, down through northern Iran, we find areas in, please, anything I say, look up all these things. There's a city called Derinkuyu that's only one of over 100 that? underground cities. D-E-R, or D-R-I-N, Derinkuyu. K U K U. Turkey. Yeah. All right. Sorry, but <laughs> that spelling is tough. Okay. Um, anyway, that's Whoa. one. That's when did one they of find over. This, you said? That's one of over two hundred underground cities. When did you say they found this? Um, they were. They just found it within the last last eighty years. No shit. I'll put pictures of that in the corner of the screen, and then I'll intersplice a map as well. So yeah, somebody was in I... there. So this is the story of people that don't know. Uh, I don't remember the exact date off my head, but it wasn't that long ago. I think it was like nineteen fifty something or sixty, but. Um, there was a guy in an apartment that was doing a project on his house in, in that part of Turkey and he collapsed a wall and literally found an entrance to the largest underground city on earth. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> now, how did they build something like that? That's what's so fascinating. These people knew that these events were so catastrophic. They could wipe out their entire civilization. We literally could disappear from history. Mm. So they created the most elaborate group of underground cities in the world, creating air shafts, areas to even bring animals down, areas for sleeping, areas for schools, areas for um, preparing food. The the It's so advanced that in the, the door, they have this gigantic round stone they had to roll in front of the door in order to seal off what was inside. How do you get, to, how did they get down there? They carved the entire thing by hand. By hand? By hand. It could house over 20,000 people. But how do you get down there? It's, it's, not like now, an it's now a tourism thing where you can go. No, I know, but back then. Back like, they then. They didn't have an elevator, did they? No, they walked down <laughs> these stairs that go down the ground. And like I said, at the entrance to this entire city, or there were many cities, not just one. Darren Cooley is just the biggest. They have this massive multi-ton stone that's round, and you can find it on images. They would roll in front of the door and seal the entire underground area for sometimes. Whoa. Are you ready for this? Potentially hundreds of years. Now, they, now so, wrap your head around that. They had to live down there potentially for hundreds of years. It means entire generations had to live down there. And you said they built air shafts and everything. Yes. But these are people now who are going to be... They, did they have any light down there or is it all candle lit? They, we don't know those things. But I can tell you that we know that most of them never made it out. That's what's and so how do scary. we know that? Because there's a site right next to them called Gobekli Tepe. And there's a newest one that's, that's, that was right next to it called Carahan Tepe. And what it is is like a cosmic library where they had these giant T-shaped multi-ton pillars that were tracking the cosmos. Again, tracking the zodiac. And each pillar has like a depiction of a constellation. Like for instance, one of them, uh, Pillar 43, is the most famous because it has the depiction of the handbags that I, I love to talk about. But also it's got the swan or the vulture known as Cygnus with Deneb, the star at the top, which is like the brightest star in our entire, mm. uh, around our solar system. So the strange thing is they seem to understand aspects of the cosmos that we don't. But getting back to Gobekli Tepe. And why is Gobekli, that's actually yeah. a great segue to that though. Like why is this so controversial yeah. within the archeological world? It seems to me as a complete outsider, yeah. like, in the last 50 years or whatever, this could be the wildest thing we've ever found. It's this incredible structure that that now is now has a lot of excavation done. Yeah. And yet I constantly keep on hearing again from the outside, like the bickering, like, well, no, it doesn't really change history of this yeah. or that. So what, what what's the origins of like why people are so yeah. like hands up about this? So what Gobekli Tepe did, and I don't think it's anywhere near as impressive for some of the architecture we're about to talk about with the new sites that are east of it in, in eastern Turkey. Mm. But what makes Gobekli so important is that – we know it's not primitive because they have these literally massive T-shaped pillars that were literally multi-ton. 
So to be able to ca carve those and then put them in place, aligned with star constellations, we know that they're an advanced people. And I, and I believe they're the same people that made Darren Kuyu mm. or related to the same group. Now, here's what's so wild about Quebec. You believe that or other people do too? Many others do okay. as well. What Quebec is Tepe is, so, is, is angering the mainstream community so much for is that, remember that 6,000 year window we talked about? Yeah. Where everything yes. has to fall into it? Yes. Gobekli oh, no. Tepe contains more advanced architecture, more advanced concepts and ideas, and shows that it's a civilization that wasn't primitive and nomadic hunter gatherers, right? Right. When they radiocarbon dated, um, which means that they find organic matter caught between the stones, which, you know, you can get a, a relatively accurate date, but it's, it's more like a ballpark. What they found is that, we think it could be a lot older, not younger. What they found is that the Gobekli Tepe is at least, based on the breakdown of the, of the carbon of it, is at least 11,600 years old. Right. Now, what that means is, and I say at least because I think it's older than that, but what that means is that, oops, it means that we had a more sophisticated civilization that's more than double as old as we're told ever was supposed to be around. When you say you think it's older than that, yeah. do you think it could have been older than the Younger Dryas? It's yes. Thought? Really? Why would any civilization be able to build anything during the Younger Dryas? We're talking about something that they most of them didn't even survive. For those who don't understand, the Younger Dryas period is this, is this period of uh, glacial to interglacial into the Holocene. The Holocene is this period of time between um, this Paleolithic period and the Holocene is this, inter is this period in between called the Younger Dryas. And it's a period of Earth history that is catastrophic. And it's about 1,500 years long. That's what I want people to wrap their heads around. Imagine, imagine if here we are, we live like about 100 years. Imagine in our lifetime, there's like one crazy event that goes on and it kills like a million people. And everyone's like, oh my God, right? Well, now imagine if you had chaotic events that, that go, that primarily are at the front end and the back end, but some in between for 1,500, 1500. years. Yeah, everything's dead. So when but, we say 12,500, is, is that marking the end of it or the beginning of it? The end of the Younger Dryas, when we went into a more stable climate, was about 11,500 years ago or so. And Gobekli Tepe is 11,600. I see what you're saying. Okay. We start, actually, I would even go a little bit later. Stabilization, where things were more comfortable on Earth to live, was more like 10,500. So it's about a thousand years later. So I understand you're saying like you don't. I want to actually change how, that statement. Yeah, yeah, it's about a thousand years later. I'd say. So you don't understand how anyone during that time period of that shit going on could have possibly built this. But what would make like? Because I know nothing about yeah. this. What would make? What's the official term? Carbon what dating? Carbon dating. So what would make the carbon dating inaccurate? I mean, I feel like from the outside, it sounds like it would go. When you start going that far back, my head just goes to, well, wouldn't it all get foggy no matter how good the tech is? But like, is that a simple explanation they or can, is it more complicated? What they do is they date the breakdown of radiocarbon. They, so they can date the, what they do is, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on this, but they basically date the decom, uh, decomposition of it breaking down. And mm. when they, they, can, they can tell how long that takes based on it, how it breaks down. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's science to it. It's very accurate. The problem is you can't date rock. This is where we're going to get into the issue that's going to continuously come up over and over and over again, is that that is the only date we can use as a benchmark. It's a benchmark date. I mm -hmm. want to make that clear. It's a benchmark date to say, we know that these advanced civilizations are at least this old because of Gobekli Tepe. That's why they don't like it. It changes the entire narrative of opening up the doors to say, this civilization we know is older. Well, what else is older? And that's, but we need to lead back to a very important conclusion of a statement we were making. They build Darren Kuyu along with countless other cities. And, and that's, I mean, that's only one example. There's some in Northern Iran and throughout that region of Turkey, they build these incredible places because they know they need to survive. Then before they go down in them, before these events of the younger Dryas, they deliberately bury Gobekli Tepe. Deliberately. Deliberately. And not only that, they some believe it took more work and more effort to bury it than it did to build it, and that's that's not now just why, my why opinion. Do, why do they say that? Burying this in the way that they did, they find evidence that they buried it to protect it, and they, so they buried it in ways uh -huh. where they could protect the pillars and everything, not just throwing you know stuff in. 
they literally were trying to make it like a time capsule. Why? Because the best the best theories on this are that they were planning to emerge in places like from places like Darren Kuyu after the event and then uncover Gobekli Tepe and then continue on their civilization and they never uncovered it, which means they never made it out. That doesn't mean nobody did. That doesn't mean nobody survived. And that's what we're about we're gonna get into today with a lot of this evidence, because some did survive. Do we have are they looking for any DNA evidence that could be down there of the dead and have they recovered anything they think could be leading there? We don't find any skeletons or dead. It wasn't a burial site. There's mm. no bones. So we don't, no one got left down there as far as we know right now. There is no evidence. Not Well, okay, this is the first statement to make. Bones don't last that long. And also, paper doesn't last very long. Mm. It is an important concept to get across. First of all, paper lasts 500 to 1,000 years. That's like nothing. That's not even the duration of the Younger Dryas event, <laughs> let alone, right? Yeah. Bones, they only last a couple thousand years, depending on what's what kind of air is getting to it, what kind of creatures are eating them, like mice and stuff will just eat bones. Um, mm. Oh yeah, I see it all the time in the woods. When you go for hikes, you'll see an, <laughs> an antler. No, you'll see no, not for like human bones, but you'll see like an antler, an antler that. where they're eating the, they're eating it all. They'll just yeah. eat them. Point is, we we don't have any other dating systems or anything available other than radiocarbon dating for the site, and it just means that it's at least eleven thousand six hundred years old because. Radiocarbon dating only gives you a benchmark of, imagine this, imagine it's way older than that, but the carbon that's in there, the carbon just means organic matter. Mm -hmm. Imagine the organic matter that they're measuring is only what got in at the very end, like before mm -hmm. it was, it was buried. So then we're thinking that it was built during that time, but no, it just means the organic matter was in there. So really what I'm thinking, if we're going to blow this whole thing open during the last ice age, so pre younger Dryas. We're going to call it, call it like 20,000 years ago, just somewhere in there, right? We had evidence around the world of highly sophisticated advanced civilizations that were not, I don't believe were like necessarily spacefaring or had the tech like we have at all. No. I mean, and that's not because we would find it because we wouldn't. That's the scary thing is that if you were to try to imagine what would be left over from our civilization, and let's, let's think about this for a second on a totality of our civilization. We record nearly everything on either paper or digitally. Nearly everything. Some stone structures we've created, like old churches or whatever, have some writing in them, on, in the stones. But most of the stuff we build is like glass, it's metal, mm -hmm. um, whatever, right? Let's say something happened to us and we were gone for like two, 3,000 years. And then another group came and was like, I don't think there's anybody here before us. What would be left from us? Okay, I want to ask you this. What do you think would be left of anything we have? I mean, anything. What would be left from us? I mean, I'd got to think. I mean, this is a separate question that I'll ask you later about some previous civilizations, but I got to think all the technology would be wiped, gone. I don't know. Well, okay, so uh, paper, paper, 500,000 years. Metal just corrodes like super fast. Glass would be gone. We would be looking at nothing that exists from our civilization. Nothing. Nothing except for, and this is the except. And this, the except here is a big except because the except is what links all this together. All, the only thing that would survive would be the stonework we made, specifically with granite. The limestone wouldn't make it. Why granite? Granite's one of the hardest materials on earth. And this is something, again, that's another one of these echo things we're going to be talking about continuously because the types of stone you work with matter significantly. If you mm. have tools that are softer than the stone you're working with, you can't even manipulate it at all. So if you go take a piece of granite, okay, from, from out in the woods or something, you'll find a chunk of granite. And you go take, like, um, things you have around the house or whatever, right, and you try to do something with that. Most of the tools you use, unless they're harder than that, aren't going to really do anything to it. True. That's they're why not gonna, people use like granite countertops all the time. That's yeah. it, it. But not only that, it lasts forever. Granite, diorite, and uh, dolomite, some of these materials, basalt, basalt, granite, were the most popular two th mm. stones, two ways that the, these ancients built. They were brilliant. We think that they were like primitive. 
No, they left behind more than we would find from our entire civilization now. I want to make that statement very clear, is that they have more from them than we would find from us. Because they built everything with these giant granite basalt megaliths. Mm. And they recorded all their stories. Not all of them did. And we'll, we'll get into Atlantis in a minute. But like the ancient Sumerians and then this, this, this new civilization we're going to talk about in eastern Turkey and all of these regions, even parts of Egypt, they wrote in stone. That's why tablets, I'm re, I, re, I mentioned the legend of Atana, we were talking about it. It's a cuneiform tablet that's, that's clay that was fired. Can you explain cuneiform to cuneiform people who don't know? Cuneiform is a style of writing that are basically you do indents into something like either stone, they use stone sometimes, like the Code of Hammurabi from ancient, uh, the Sumerian region um, is a giant granite st stele that's got cuneiform. And what it means is like they... Realize that if you try to draw something on a surface, like a like a painting, it's just going to disappear. So the only way to have a message preserved would be to etch it into stone or clay. And they realize if you do that, it can potentially serve, if it's a hard enough material, not limestone or something, if it's granite or basalt, it can potentially survive for 10, 20, 30, potentially 50,000 years. Does it matter what the elements of some sort of natural disaster crisis are for it to survive though as an example yeah could something like that survive and if i'm asking some stupid questions no, today i'm sorry good. i don't know a lot about, <laughs> okay. about like carbon dating and stuff mm -hmm. like that but could something like the volcano eruption at pompeii if all the volcanic fluids got all over the magma got all over the the tablets could that totally destroy them could something with that type of force like make it null and void some things were undoubtedly destroyed yeah but one of the one of the amazing things about it and again i credit the sumerians and the later iterations of them being the greatest most sophisticated thinking people in the world they used clay for a reason what's so funny about clay is that in order to make clay the most durable possible you have to put it in fire mm. it's brilliant so they did they did some stone yeah because they did granite, and that'll last a long time. But that's really hard to do. To carve integrate messages into granite's not easy, and that gets into what you're talking about with some of the pottery from Egypt. But they realized that if they if they took clay and then wrote all their stories etched into it cuneiform, meaning in, embedded into the rock in the in the clay, and then they fired it, it could last somewhere around six thousand years. So some of the tablets were rewritten over and over again from subsequent entire civilizations to preserve the original story of those civilizations. All right, so I'm going to cut forward to a question that I <laughs> kind of buried a few minutes ago because yeah. it's just coming into my mind with everything you're saying. But the thing that, that kind of keeps me up at night when I'm wondering about how these civilizations worked is the technological aspect because mm -hmm. and you hinted at this earlier like there's certain things where they were way more advanced potentially but certain things where we have evidence to say they were not nearly as advanced mm -hmm. and so i always go back to what i know and what's in my hand and like i have an iphone in my hand but i would imagine a lot of that would be destroyed is there is there a possibility that some of the, I'm, I'm not saying the one you're talking about right mm -hmm. now but perhaps some of these other civilizations that date back across all these different younger driest periods, let's call it, like these different events that could have happened. Is there a possibility that there were civiliz civilizations that existed with hardcore artificial intelligence and things way beyond iPhones that was just so destroyed yeah. over and over again that like we have no ability to ever even try to find evidence of it? This is what's funny and it parallels our civilization so on point. When we're trying to find what's left from them, we find that the more advanced a civilization became, the less they did, they put the work into recording that. It was weird. Hmm. So for instance, there's not a single writing left behind from Atlantis. Because That's they didn't mystery. they didn't make they didn't do cuneiform writing into stones. They probably had paper and they probably had digital records. Digital. The reason I say that is that we've found some really weird artifacts in the Mediterranean over the last hundred years. There was, a, there was an artifact found off of Greece that has mechanical components in it that don't make sense. 
I don't remember what it is off my head. So this is the one Michu Kaku talked yeah. about. This was down at the bottom yeah. of the Mediterranean. That's it. Thank you. It was the it was a computer yes. around Thank you. from the Roman era, I believe. It was about two thousand years old and what it did and he explained why it was considered a computer. Yeah. But what it did was it would measure I think it was like the constellations or something like that. Yeah. I'm definitely gonna have intersplice that clip into <laughs> okay. here so we'll yeah. have the context yeah. of it out of the real man's mouth explaining it. Uh, around nineteen hundred or so, uh, there was a shipwreck off the coast of Greece mm -hmm. and divers found an instrument encrusted in coral. It looked like a piece of junk, but when they cleaned it, they realized, no, it's a machine, a machine that is 2,000 years old. And then, then they took x-rays of it, and they realized it's a computer. My God, a computer. They a computer. Think a computer that was to, supposed to be a gift to Julius Caesar, but the ship uh, sunk. And it was there at the bottom of the uh, Mediterranean for 2,000 years until divers found it. And when they moved the coral away, they found out that it was a computer. It was an analog computer that modeled the universe. The universe known at that time, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, like a planetarium, a little planetarium that you could put on a desktop that modeled the known universe 2,000 years ago. Mm. But that... I'm glad you brought that up. That blew my mind. I'm gonna look up the name of the the name of the town Artifact where that was and, from. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead. So, and again, I don't study that aspect of history. Like, there's a lot of people that take these lost artifacts and they try to place them. I think it's fascinating. I only bring it up just to say, look, we don't know how how advanced Atlantis became. We know some things when we go into the records and i and i think this is probably an important point to make before people think that i'm just spouting off something that plato made as an allegory antikythera was the name by the way okay thank i had you. to get that yeah, right yeah 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 we have so much emerging evidence that atlantis was real and not only that but other civilizations that it's becoming overwhelming i want everyone for a second just to take a step back and be like i don't care about plato's story right now Let's put that off the side. I'm so sick of people saying that that's the only reason Atlantis is around or exists because of Plato. That's not Can true. Can you give the context of that for people yeah. who aren't familiar? Yeah, yeah. People will say, a, a lot of mainstream will say that Plato made up the entire story of Atlantis based on an allegory to compare against the pre-Greek culture to show their superiority mm. as democracy versus an empire. That's their, he's got all kinds of stories in that. But what I would point out is, no, he only used the example of what was real to then show because um, we're uh, we're just we're working on releasing um, the new season of Ancient Civilizations Five on Gaia, and what we do is we go deep into telling the actual evidence that it, to prove Atlantis existed in a way that nobody else has. But not only that, to prove that there was another rival civilization that existed at the same time called the Ancient Athenians, mm. the pre Greeks. Now, and how many years are we going back with this? We're going back over at least 20,000 years because Plato gives us the date of Atlantis' destruction. So we don't know when Atlantis was created, but we know when it was destroyed. Atlantis was destroyed 2,000 years before Plato existed. So we're talking about, uh, or before Solon. So we're we're talking about, uh, not 2,000 years, we're talking about a date, uh, a, a time period of around, around 10,600 years or so. And that, who was Solon? Solon is uh, a th uh, basically an Athenian Greek priest or poet who is the first person from the outside world to come to, into Egypt and learn about this ancient history that they didn't know. And I haven't even told the story of Atlantis yet. Um, I was just, well, let's stay on that. I don't want to okay. get you off it. Yeah, I don't want to. So what we need to point out is that the story doesn't come from Plato. The story comes from much earlier ancestors. It comes from a man named Solon who came before Socrates, okay? Solon was, was a Greek poet and philosopher who was the first person from the outside world to travel to Egypt thousands of years ago. This is before, um, before the Roman Empire went and basically destroyed Egypt. And I think that's important for us to understand. Yeah. What happened was, he, Solon goes and visits this incredible temple called the Temple of Sais, S-A-I-S. 
and it was a real temple and there's been depiction art depictions drawn of it because it was destroyed after Solon left. We don't exa know exactly how long, but after Solon learned about the, the story I'm about to tell you and left, within the next thousand years, the Temple of Sais didn't exist any longer. Mm. Somebody destroyed it. Somebody wiped this story that I'm about to tell you. Solon goes down. He finds this incredible temple um, near Heliopolis in Egypt. And he finds these this elder priest named Sanchez. Okay, Sanchez, for this is a name, for people to want to look it up. And he had a bunch of other priests with him. But Sanchez was a special kind of priest. He was an elder priest that knew absolutely ancient. And I mean, like I say absolutely in quotes. He knew ancient history so old that it wasn't really even recorded by most other places in the and world And how did anymore. he know that, allegedly? The Temple of Sais had inscriptions writing the entire history of Earth down. The Temple of Sais was supposed to be, like the, like the Library of Alexandria, not that far away, that was supposed to be a library of the works of people through literature and all these things. But the Temple of Sais was supposed to be this way to record our history. And it's described that these priests were, the single thing they were supposed to do, there was nothing else, was to maintain the story of history. And they had this entire story of this, in, this ancient civilization called Atlantis in, written into their walls. And they say that Egypt came out of Atlantis. And what, what he says is, he says, Solon, you Greeks remember one deluge, but there have been many that have come before, mm -hmm. primarily of water and fire. Goes on to tell him that what we think of as the old world is not even that old, and that there's ancient, ancient chapters of civilizations that have come, risen, been destroyed, and then tried to rise up. But every time they were destroyed, more and more knowledge was lost and not less. Uh. So Sanchez tells Solon this entire story. And he takes it back and he tells it to two people. He tells it to Diodorus, who's another Greek philosopher. I love Diodorus. I wish people would lean more on Diodorus than Plato for the story of Atlantis. Mm. Diodorus, and he told Socrates. Plato wasn't even around yet. That's what people don't know, is that it wasn't, and Socrates f didn't feel like it was, he believed that it, you, we shouldn't write things down because they can be misunderstood, which is kind of silly. Mm. because he used to give talks and uh, eventually he was poisoned by his own government. Just so you know, he was killed. Socrates was murdered by his own government for speaking out. And when that happened, Plato... That's sketchy. Plato talks about how it was, it was like, his, like losing a father and how he then took up the role of writing every piece of knowledge that Socrates had taught. Ta Socrates was like his great mentor. He taught everything to Plato. So he took on this task of writing everything that Socrates had told him. But knowing that Socrates, this is why people, I need people to understand this. Knowing Socrates had just been murdered by their own government, poisoned, because of speaking out, he couldn't write the story of Atlantis down. So he, he wove, he, he, he woven it into, put it into an allegorical story so that people would, like the truth would be preserved, but also they would think it's an allegory and it's not real. He's brilliant. Like he, wow. he did it so that he he could be preserved. That's, he had to do that. That's how the story went. And that's where, it, but Diodorus and Plato and Solon and the Sanchez priest of the Temple of Sais, this isn't, this isn't a myth. Like this is real. And the Egyptians say that there was a grand civilization that existed west of the Pillars of Hercules, okay? Straits of Gibraltar in Spain. And that it was a civilization that lived somewhere around the Azores, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And they were right on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So people that don't know what that is, it's two tectonic plates that come together in this massive area. And it's one of the most active places in the world for earthquakes and volcanoes. Why would you build a civilization on that? Well, that gets into other, like, whole questions about whether or not they were trying to utilize energy in a certain way or something. Ah. Right? Because it seems like we keep finding examples of these civilizations that like built right on a fault or something or built somewhere that's unstable, but obviously they have different reasons for doing it. Which we, But on the surface, it seems like it goes against their supposed intelligence that they had. Like They're not thinking like we do. They're not like, oh, mm. hey, look, they have, there's plenty of water over there for agriculture. This is a great climate. We can like chill out, hang out. They don't care about that. These were advanced people. They already, they already mastered that. They already mastered all those things. They were now doing something for other reasons. 
that we are still trying to figure out like why the great the pyramids were created well dumb question here maybe but thinking across some of these different periods mm -hmm. across the different younger dryas type periods is it possible that from an evolutionary perspective some of the people we're talking about are not humans the way we are humans there's some other type of life form that's in a similar plane but is in some ways different so one of the things that the big rabbit hole we're going to go down when we get to it because <laughs> this is all just sort of just so everybody knows this is literally just laying like the framework for what yeah. we're about to talk about we haven't even gotten to it yet what we find is that there was an obsession in the ancient world over bloodlines and i mean like an obsession they we talked last night about how the egyptians in the book of the dead would be obsessed with this idea of a, of a being that was a ruler that they thought was like a descendant of the gods that they would go through processes to try to bring that soul back in after it died to rule again that's how obsessed mm. they were was that they they saw it as being something and i don't want this to come across as being some kind of a racial or superior thing that but they all people on earth are amazing and beautiful they simply, they had the opinion that there were gifts within those bloodlines that connected to these ancient Anuna, mm. Anunnaki Anuna gods of Sumer, right. to, to lay it out there. They believed that the kings and rulers there were descendants of them. And we, the, one, of the, one of the weird things we have evidence to support that, though, is that some of the lengths of reigns is really weird. When you look at Sumerian king list and we look at like understanding the journeys of like the Gilgamesh and all these things, they list commonly, and not just in one tablet, but many, many tablets that some of them ruled for like a thousand years. Is it possible that like there's some sort of mistake in the dating going on there or their system could have been different in how they measured that? I don't believe so when I, when you read the tablets, because they talk about it. They talk about how humans used to almost be immortal. But could it... All right, here's another one. Yeah. So like you look in North Korea right now where they're brainwashed. They know that like their former supreme leader is dead, right? But, okay. their, but their current supreme leader, his son, is alive. The grandfather and the father are dead. But the, the, the idea of the grandfather and the father live on as like a deity saint. And so I don't know. I'm not North Korean. I don't know what it's like to be brainwashed like that. But perhaps there are people there who in a way view them as this living spirit or whatever. Okay. And if they were writing down their history that was found a million years from now, I don't even think they're allowed to do that. But if they were, you know, perhaps it could be mistaken that like – Kim Jong Il, the father, was alive for the next totally, thousand years. Totally, no? totally get that. And I think the reason we see that is because they're trying to mimic things. It's weird. It seems like the later groups that came tried to have the mindset and do some of the things that the earlier groups could do and they couldn't do it. Mm. And I say that because we find architecture of them trying to build around some of these structures and they just couldn't do it. They like they tried all over the world to do the same stonework and they, they couldn't do any of it. And so the th what I'm trying to say is, I think there's tangibility to all of this and mm -hmm. that there were literal people that are talked about as living for hundreds of years. And I say that because there's a sets of tablets, one called Death of Bill Games, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the, uh, Adrahasis, I could go on and on. I, and I've studied, I'm one of the premier experts of studying ancient cuneiform from Sumer, Babylon, Assyria, and that whole region. I've studied more than 150 tablets from the best experts in the world. And the whole purpose of how I've connected this is that I've taken what is myth, considered myth, and taken all these real locations and what they say in them and try to create a timeline to recreate history. That's where this comes from. And what they say... <laughs> you say that like it's Tuesday. <laughs> and what they say in the tablets is that this king we're about to talk about in this story was the last human given immortality on, or, on, or on earth. Given immortality. Yes. It states that after he lived, it says in the death of Bill Games, this is a set of, it's a tablet. It says that after that point, it's, it's the biblical Noah figure whose real name was Untanda Pishtim or Isaiah Sudra. It states that he was the last human, human being that was ever immortal and that all humans after became mortal. And we, what we find that's, to, to, to answer what you were saying, is we find later kings lists later ones after Kish and after that time period of like the later iterations and they were only ruling for like 80 years, 70 years. 
So something, something happened. Something happened. Yeah. Something happened to us. And they, that's, but that's the whole point is that those bloodlines survived and they had gifts within them. And I think the gifts enabled them to create things that we don't know how they did. But they're just not in any way, quote unquote, immortal or. No. Yeah. No, but the, I think that's mm. why groups later, like now, there still is an obsession with bloodlines. Yeah, because weird you, stuff. I was gonna say you keep saying this, and I'm like, in my head, I'm going, what? How's that different though? In a way, I mean, I I got neighbors who are like all about their family and shit, and you know, have had the same. This business is different. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. This is. Imagine there was a group of humans that were like superhuman. Okay. And now imagine that group of humans is the one that created all of these incredible structures around the world, including the pyramids of Egypt. And they're put to, and when you say superhuman, there's a correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah. There's an easy connotation to say perhaps they emanate from not of this earth. That is a possibility. That is a distinct possibility. And truthfully, I think that we're f the, like the ancients of all echoed, no matter it's Hindu text, Vedic text, Sumerian text, it whether or not it's something from ancient Atlantis. It, the same thing is echoed. We are an incredibly powerful being that we don't understand and we've forgotten and that our ancestors were like the remnants of gods and giants. That's what they state. Atlantis was not ruled by mortal humans. It says that Atlantis was ruled by demigod kings beneath the, the, the king Atlas. There was a king named Atlas, which is why they're called the Atlas Mountains in Mauritania. And the Atlantis civilization is based on the Atlantic Ocean. There was a, they state that there were demigod kings that ruled from a specific bloodline of Poseidon. And Poseidon, you find out, is the exact same god as Enki and Sumer. So there's a lot of parallels that are really interesting here when we look at these civilizations. So what do I believe before we get into the proof? I believe that Atlantis and the Athenians were the, and potentially Egypt with uh, the Giza Plateau, which used to be called Kemet or Kem. I believe that represented the height of the greatest level these civilizations ever reached in our history. That's what I think they are. But it's relative in the sense that there's things we could have today that that are insane that they never scratched the surface of. But overall, when it comes to knowledge of previous civilizations, when it comes to abilities with architecture and some other things like that, you view this as by far the most advanced we ever were. Well, oh, imagine you had, a, you had a society that wasn't structured around materialism, first of all. So imagine, like, so I just want to throw it out there. Why do we need a phone? Like, why do we need one, though? To connect us to other people. Okay, but now we don't go talk to anybody and we don't go talk to our neighbors. We now have connected to a whole other group of people around the world, but we've disconnected from most people around us. I see what you're saying. They believed that the inherent core of what makes us the strongest we can is by protecting certain values. The values were... The, the goal of them was that people needed to be taught in great schools, they called, and, and a, people that were unique had to be identified and, and encouraged. So they had these great mystery schools, Egypt and Peru, all these places. And what they would do is they would identify people that are unique and special, and they would try to encourage the gifts within them to reach mm. like almost like superhuman um, abilities, telekinesis, psychic abilities, um, things that we don't understand now. They created temples in very specific energetic spots on the earth to align to the stars in the cosmos for like a portal between the stars. <laughs> I'm telling you, we think they were primitive, but they just had a completely different mindset than we did. It sounds like they're more or less the things across a large scale of our population that we're focused on. Like you put the term materialism on it. I'll take it a step farther. Sure. The things we're focused on are earthly. The things they're focused on are, are otherworldly. They were obsessed with this. They were obsessed with this um, hermetic concept, like obsessed, which is this concept of as above, so below. It's called the law of correspondence. They believed that if you created a structure on Earth that mimicked the stars, you could harness the energy and power of the universe. Mm. So they created the three pyramids of Giza to represent the three belt stars of Orion because they believed that Orion was an incredibly powerful star system. That I don't think we understand like, how. For instance, Graham's got this great theory that he says where he Hancock. believes, Graham Hancock, where he believes that the Egyptians showing the Milky Way constellation in Orion, they believe that the path of the souls through death and incarnation was through the Milky Way, and, but specifically through the belt stars of Orion. Mm. So maybe they were mapping out the path of the afterlife. 
But that's only one tip of the iceberg. Because if you were to try to balance the poles magnetically and they didn't shift from these events, and we haven't gotten into this yet, you potentially could avoid disaster on the earth. Because all of this, in my opinion, <laughs> is reflective on the, the energetic movements of the earth, not the physical movements, that comes after. So if the energy of the earth, the poles are shifting and the magnetic sphere of the earth is all screwing up, then everything on land and on water is gonna follow. Plates are gonna shift, volcanoes are gonna go off, everything is, it's like a ripple, in a, like a wave in a pool where you set it off and it, it takes a second for the actual reaction to occur. Hey guys, just a really quick note about this part you're about to hear. For about two to three minutes, there's a little bit of an audio interference in the background. It's only bad for about 15 or 20 seconds, but I could not remove this part because we then expanded upon it so much afterwards that it would have ruined the whole flow of everything. So just bear with me. You'll see a countdown timer on the screen that's gonna show when it's pretty much all done and the rest of the episode is smooth sailing. <laughs> So I don't want to go to the pyramids yet, Okay. but what you're getting at here is essentially saying that to me, like as my conclusion would be that these, these people were thinking about the, the tiered civilizations. So like what I, they I knew, think, I think Michu defined it like type zero, type yeah. one, type two, type three. Yeah. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, please. I'll check it after this, but I believe a type two civilization is harnessed the power of a star. Whereas type three is intergalactic. Yeah. So essentially what you're telling me is that these people who perhaps didn't have things like the iPhone or something like that were thinking way ahead of that though, because that's type zero type shit, to harness the power right. of the sun that yeah. they could then use for their purposes to become intergalactic. I think in and nothing against Michio Kaku, I love that man. I love I just think we're too focused on technology in those sense that we see it. So perhaps like imagine a structure built at a very specific stone with minerals in it that have like, for instance, mostly quartz based, which we know quartz is, is critical component of time based, um, being able to keep, keep track of time quartz. We, granted it's one of the highest concentrations of silica quartz in the world. It's just not, it's not, these things aren't random. They seem to be using those as their technology. You understand? So yes. they create, this structure that's got like an energetic signature, a vibrational signature because of what they made, then they align it to the stars or the sun or whatever. They're doing the same thing. They're mm. like I, I, they're like a type two civilization that's different than we're described though. They're just, I see what you're they saying. Jumped, yes. They jumped to use, um, like Nikola Tesla, everything in the universe just comes down to vibration and frequency. Like we're, we're going about this the wrong way. We, we can get there this way. But there's other ways to get there. They they went a different path. They went a different direction because I think that there's there's there was it was known not perhaps not to them, but maybe like archetypes of all this is it was known that going this route is dangerous. Going the technological route is the most is the quickest way to destroying yourself. But how do you know that before you do it? Because that's not even so, like you look at our history of technology every single time we've had some sort of crazy new technology that okay. hits the airways there's always the doomsday sayers who are like oh my god this is going to end us it's going to disconnect us and to this i'm not saying that yeah, won't yeah, eventually I happen it. i get it but to this point every time those people in history look very stupid so how could at say the most type like primitive technological level like an industrial revolution type level compared to where we're at right now how could how could a civilization of group think because that's what people still do they fall into group thing how could they possibly have the foresight that foresight to say we're going to prevent all of us from ever trying to make shit like because this? i think we're looking at it through the long the wrong lens mm. i feel like okay imagine just let's open up our minds to the idea that the universe is vast and there are trillions of earth-like planets and worlds but Let's try to not even focus on that for a minute. What it's described in these tablets is that they created civilization with specific blueprints in mind. They called them Mies, M-E apostrophe S. Mm. And there were these divine tablets that said, and, and you can look one up, one of them is called the Code of Hammurabi. It literally is the blueprint for how to create a civilization. The moral structure is there, um, how to think of, our, of us in terms of how powerful we are, 
and there's many others like this. They're sort of similar to Moses's ten tablets, but that's like a whole later thing. So the Hammurabi Code of Laws, I have behind you a collection of 282 rules, established standards for commercial interactions, and set fines and punishments to meet the requirements of justice. Hammurabi's code was carved onto a massive finger-shaped black stone steel pillar that was looted by invaders and finally rediscovered in 1901. Yeah, so Hammurabi says it's so funny. Like, and I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase just out of my head. It goes, sure. Hammurabi, um, I was basically like devoted or appointed by uh, Bell Marduk to rule over the black-headed people and blah, bring justice and blah blah blah. Right. He, what, but the point I'm trying to make is he says he's handed it down, mm. not by like a person, but like a god. Bell Marduk was the was the god of Babylon in ancient Mesopotamia. And um, one of the things that's that's so odd is that it, um, in records, it's talked about how Mesopotamia is conquered by later groups. Um, and one in particular, uh, it's mentioned that, um, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it, not Alexander the Great, but um, um, I'm going to think of it in a second, but he mentions how he conquered Babylon and he was afraid of their patron god, like afraid of him. In a way that it wasn't an, like an like an idea, is what I'm trying to say. How, is that a just interpretation? Um, I do believe there's validity to some of these creators of what we're talking about. In do you terms think it of, could have been urban legend though too, and that's what he's afraid of because he actually believed it. It's described that if you fall out of the favor, out of the favor of some of these powerful gods, that you become nothing. And that you disappear into the history books. And that they call themselves the ordainers of destinies because we're essentially like we're in a great play, like Shakespeare said, and we're all playing roles. Mm. And But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is when kingship was created in, in Eridu, which is what we're going to jump to in a second here, it describes how civilization was created and it came out of nowhere. Like literally out of nowhere. And that it wasn't just that the civilization emerged there. They emerged with nearly everything that we know today is the building blocks of our civilization. The Sumerians created, invented agriculture, basis of all civilization, metallurgy, right? Working with metals, animal husbandry, having animals, um, astronomy, um, astrology, fermentation. Like I could literally go on and on. What years are we talking about the Sumerians, by the well, way? Well, which iteration did they invent that? I don't think it's a 6,000 year one. I think mm -hmm. what we're talking about with Eridu, and which is why we're about to get into all of this, how old is Eridu? I think Eridu may be over 50,000 years old. Just thinking about all the shit that had to happen between that. It's That's what huge. I just can never wrap my head around. Like how any of this, we can't even, we can't even agree now on what happened 11,600 years ago. And then you start talking 50,000. It's like, it's inconscionable. Okay. So can you look up a stat for me? Sure. Tell me when, uh, like, the first camera was invented. When was first camera invented? The French inventor, nice afford in a piece, eh? I definitely said What's that the year, though? fucking wrong. What's the year? Images in 1825. Okay, how long ago is that? That's like 200 years ago. Yeah, give or take. In 200 years, look at how far we've come. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now imagine... If a civilization had been advanced that disappeared twelve thousand years ago, oh, it's absurd, man! You I don't can't think, even fathom it. I don't think we can wrap our heads around it. So, and that's why I can't believe when we start talking about whatever these periods are. Yeah, doesn't matter if it's twelve thousand, fifty thousand, hundred thousand, wherever you're going. I can't fathom a world. I mean, you did say like digital referring to Atlantis. I do want to come back to that. But like, I can't fathom a world where they didn't have something way beyond like AI. And this is where the open question um, needs to remain, though, is we don't know how adv advanced Atlantis became. Fair. And that may be why we have those weird artifacts in the Mediterranean. And the th I want to add one more thing. We know that Atlantis didn't, didn't leave behind any stones with writings in them. It means that they had become advanced enough. They were probably doing what kind of like what we're doing with at least paper, scrolls and paper and other means. And that just tells us that they were already at a different level because, and that doesn't mean it was a good level because I think that they became too cocky and arrogant. 
Mm. It's described, it's interesting because we have a lot of details of what happened to Atlantis. It's described that Atlantis started as a pure place of incredible knowledge. And then, it, and then what happened was it became an empire and became warlike. And it describes how it even had slavery going on in North Africa. Like it, this is, these are like detailed details, right? And how there was a rival civilization that existed at the same time as them. That was the only one that could stand up what to them militarily, again? the ancient Athenians, like the pre-Greeks, right? Which is why the Greeks and that whole area seemed to have this like perfected democracy that seems to have come from nowhere. They, it describes in that and how they were the birthplace of democracy, the original Athenians, and they weren't using slavery or empire building. And that's why Plato used them as the two examples in the Timaeus and Critias, as well as his other books, because they became the perfect two examples of how one civilization can be corrupted and turn into an empire mm -hmm. and how the other one can still maintain strength, but can maintain their core values. And it describes how Atlantis went to war with the Athenians and that ultimately the uh, Atlanteans were destroyed during the earth catastrophes at the end of the Younger Dryas. Plato gives us an exact date. And do we know how long, some of this stuff, like there's a lot of details going on. So yeah, if there's a couple please. of things you repeat yeah. here and there, just bear with me. But do we know how long approximately Atlantis could have lasted for, like when it began, if we know where it ended? We, the best, I, the best we can do is, and I placed Atlantis as being created 50,000 years ago. Based on, um, honestly, largely circumstantial evidence, but we have to put it somewhere. And I base that on geologic history of that region, when things occurred. And I also base it on, um, I do think that Edgar Cayce, who was, um, who was a psychic medium, is one of the only few that I actually think was legit ever what throughout makes history. What he was legit? The things he said, have, a lot of them have come true. And like what? Like when he discusses aspects of Atlantis and, and what happened later, it matches up with like archaeological evidence and evidence from that period of what was happening. And it, it just, it gives credence to the fact that they had recorded as much as they could about this. And then even like the temple priests of Sais were ultimately either killed or died and the temple was destroyed. And so I want to throw this out there, but if Solon had never visited Egypt, we would never know any of this existed. Well, that's the other thing, too. When I've heard people in the past talk about Atlantis, there's arguments over when, there's yeah. arguments over where, mm -hmm. and it seems like it's it seems like it's all over the map. So what, like... But Plato gives very detailed descriptions of where it is and how big it is and how many rings it has and that it was located... Basically, all like Randall breaks it down in his podcast, Randall Carlson, really well. Is that listen, we're pretty sure it was like right where the Azores are. If you go look at yeah. bathymetric charts of the seafloor, you can see that there was a plateau of land that, that was underneath that area that was like wiped out. Now, the descriptions of how it was destroyed is important because it says that it was subducted and sank into the ocean. Now, when we look at plate subduction, plates moving, it's on the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Exactly mm. where plates are moving right there. So, maybe got, yeah. so if we were to have a plate dive under the other one during catastrophe things with the earth, it literally can take the, that entire civilization or whatever and just sink it to the bottom of the ocean, which is exactly how it's described. That's exactly how it's described. And the weird thing, and I want to add one little thing to that. There's this really bizarre set of ruins that validate that. Off of the western tip of Cuba in, in the early 2000s, they found these incredibly bizarre ruins at 2,000 feet underwater. Like, you want to pull up something yes, really quick? Please. Go look up Sunken City off of Cuba really quick. Sunken City off of Cuba. Now, this is what gives, gives credibility to Cuban the fact... Cuban underwater formation? Click that right there. What that is, is there was um, some marine engineers that were hired by the Cuban government. Holy shit. Yeah. So there were marine engineers hired by the Cuban government in, in the early 2000s to go search off of Western Cuba using sonar to find shipwrecks and like uh, gas deposits. And they had no interest in archaeology at all. And what happened was they were surveying 
2,000 feet underwater off of Western Kipa, Cuba, in this massive sandy plateau that was literally like miles and miles and miles long with no rocks or anything. And they come across this set of structures that is 11 and a half by 11 and a half miles. I'm going to put the picture in the corner of the screen. Actually, it's, I think it's square, it's, it's, it's square miles or whatever, but the, the surface area is enormous. These pyramid looking things. So what they found, yes, what they found is that they, they pull out these, they used sonar recreation to create what's on the floor because it's 2,000 feet below the ocean. What they found well, apparently is... apparently that's not too deep in light of the Titanic. Yeah, right. <laughs> Go down there in a fucking tin can. What they found is it almost made them not share it because they were thought they were going to be ridiculed. They they found this, and they used these recreated sonar images, and they were baffled. And he sat... the. Zelinsky is his name. They He sat on, uh, sat on his computer, I guess, for months, and one day... He had a, a calendar next to him, and it had a picture of Mayan ruins, and he like freaked out because it's like this. because he realized that this is right off of the Yucatan. It's between yeah. the Yucatan and, and Cuba. Of course, the Mayan civilization is very mysterious, yeah. and is supposed to have potential links to Atlantis. He he shares this with a geologist named Iterolde in Cuba, who comes out for a second expedition and starts getting the interest of National Geographic. Okay, so Iteralde goes with him. He's a geologist from Cuba, and they go with a submersible to the wreckage, and they he dives down and they analyze it, and he says he's completely baffled by it, and that it's not not natural by any means, and that the structures look like a series of streets, temples, pyramids, and if anything, mimics. yeah. What's the right? So the right side of this picture again. I'll have that in the corner of the yeah. screen. So we have the pyramid-looking things on the left. Yes. But is that supposed to be on the right side, like those street patterns? Yeah. And, and but but notice in the bottom part of the image, there's there's severe Where, destruction. Yeah. Um, something happened here. There's stuff strewn all over the place. They described it as massive blocks that were strewn all over the ocean floor. Now here's where it gets bizarre. They built the blocks out of what looked like giant granite just like we see in other parts of the world, and they were cut very precisely. And the geologist said, and this is where the Atlantis, I get another theory of Atlantis. Iteralde, the Cuban geologist, says that the only time that that part of the ocean could have been different enough geologically would have been 50,000 years ago. He said exactly that number. Ah, uh, that's where, okay. He said exactly 50,000. That's another, that gave me a little goosebump. Right? right? He says 50,000 years ago, just like Edgar Casey said about Atlantis. Now... Here's what's, I want to add another little thing for you to freak you out. There was a Tibetan library in the, in the 19, 1901 by, uh, or so, where there was a traveling um, anthropologist expert in the region, Tibet. And he met with this Buddhist monk who had told him that he had discovered a secret, secret library known as the Cave of a Thousand Buddhas. Mm. Okay? In that library, in, up in this cave up in the mountains, in that library he found these manuscripts from all over the world from different like Hindu texts and all these things. But one of them had a map, had an ancient map in it. And the map depicted Atlantis as a region that existed from west of the pillars of Hercules as a region all the way to, to the Yucatan. And that that really was, I think what that, make that means that those ruins off of Cuba are part of Atlantis. So That's what it, it means. It's stretching across the whole fucking earth. It means that it's part of Atlantis. That's why we see similar architecture in Peru than we do in, in Egypt and we do in our other parts of the world. But obviously, we know Pangea, Pangea was like millions of years ago, so that's, that's, not, yeah, that's not completely irrelevant. Yeah. But is there any type of possible explanation that says the plate movement could have like shifted things way off course? I mean, that seems way well, too far okay. for me for that. That's crazy. Here's the thing that's weird. Every single ancient structure in the, in, the, in the ancient world, cities or whatever, they aligned themselves to true north, okay, magnetic mm. north. All of them did. They were obsessed with cardinal points and understanding all of that. It had to do with energy. Every single one of them, every single one anywhere in the world is off by magnetic north by 23 and a half degrees. Every single one of them. Perfect. If you look today at the axis of the Earth and what creates the seasons, there's a 23 and a half degree shift on the Earth, which is what creates the precession of the equinox. Oh my it God. means that when those structures were created, we did not have an axial tilt that we have today, which is why they describe the ancient world as being very different climatically and geologically than it is now. 
Something happened so significant during Younger Dryas that it shifted the axis of the earth. Now you can explain how something like Atlantis could be subducted with another with plates because we're talking about catastrophes during that period that were so severe. It was like an apocalypse on the earth. Is there any even slightly confident, decent theory as to what that could have been? Yes. So this falls into two camps. The two camps may be overlapping. I will acknowledge that. Okay. Hmm. I... And that's, that's just getting into what may be like an entire part two of this podcast because it's like a whole nother rabbit hole. Now, I have enormous amounts of respect for Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock and others. I, I love their work. The only thing I disagree with them is on why these things happened. I, based on the fact that I have not seen evidence of any cosmic impact craters on the earth that are less than 13,000 years old. It, and again, and a Grandel and I had a great debate on this. And he's like, well, what if they're micro craters in the, in the ice caps? Totally. Yes, maybe. If I, if you had, if you had, um, parts of a meteorite or an asteroid that, that broke up and hit the ice cap. Yeah. You wouldn't have any geologic evidence of that. Agreed. But the problem is that the, the effects we're seeing on the earth also align precisely with massive coronal mass ejections. And Robert Massive Sh what? Coronal mass ejections. Can you explain that, please? Yeah. So like Robert Schock is the one who spearheaded this whole thing. And his theory is that if we look at the Rongo Rongo text from Easter Island, he, he him and his wife believe they, they figured out that their plasma plasma um are displays in the sky. Plasma. Like from a massive event that's about to happen elect electrically, like th through um shifting of the poles in the magnetosphere, you would have these massive a plasma um, figurines in the sky and things that would go off because there's such charged energy in the atmosphere with that with those shifting of the poles that it literally it'd be chaos. There would mm. be lightning storms all over the earth. There would be plasma discharging. So his theory was that the people knew that was a warning sign that that's that something was going to happen. And that's when they would go underground. Now oh, he doesn't wow. say the underground part. I want to just be very clear because I so don't want to say so something. How are you taking he that just away? says that's a war They notice that as a warning that an event is about to occur. And so you think that ties back to things like you saw it like a Beckley Tabby. Yeah. Okay. Now the reason I say this is this: we have structures like um, there's a snake monument that's in Peru, um, that's outside of like the whole Machu Picchu Cusco area. That's got a black stripe across it called vitrification, means that the rock melted. Mm. That same stripe we can find in other places. Um, in the Colossi of Memnon, we can find it in the Kinnis rock in Iraq, and we can find it throughout Megalus in Turkey and even in China and other places in the world. Remember, they built with mostly granite? Yes. In order to melt and, and make a black mark, you would have to melt, literally melt the rock. If you were to melt granite, you'd have to have temperatures on the surface that exceeded 2000 degrees. So like, you go to Death Valley right today, everyone's like, oh my God, it's 118. Nothing. Come How about 2000? Oh my God. Meaning that anybody, anybody who's on the surface in, in areas would have been a, just evaporate basically. Yeah. And so that's why they had to go underground because what we're, and that didn't happen everywhere but on the can earth. That, can you even, but well, hold on. Could that you even be saved there? Didn't happen equally everywhere. So that we wouldn't have any life on the earth still. We're talking about events that are somewhat localized, but all over the planet. Oh my God. So some areas get hit a lot worse than others. Like for instance, it seems like the Amazon was like, besides massive flooding, was mostly intact. So there's like parts of the world that didn't seem to have, be nearly as impacted and it looks like they're near the equator. That's why, like mm. Randall Carlson talks about how the greatest, the, the greatest amount of megafauna, meaning large animals we still on the earth is in Africa which would show because of the fact that most of the megafauna in the Northern Hemisphere was just, was killed during the Younger Dryas event. And some iterations of that came later, but they're nowhere near which what they is were before. Yeah, which is, okay. But Africa, that makes total sense. But Africa was largely uh, escaped some of these events. And so that's why so much of the life in Africa is still re maintained from, from ancient, ancient times. Whereas in the Northern Hemisphere, everything is smaller. Bears are smaller, beavers are smaller, deer are smaller. Everything is like the smaller version of what it used to be. So what do you think? When we got we to gotta get into this too. We haven't even started this yet. We haven't started the thing that you think yeah. is going to change history. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, let's go there then. You want to jump there? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. So in my studies, what led me to all of this is that about eight years ago or so, or more, I can't remember exactly when, I started becoming almost obsessed with cuneiform tablets. I didn't want to regurgitate something that someone else said. And I'm not going to mention a name right now. Okay. But I wanted to know who the best translators in the world were and who knew this better than anyone. And what I realized was that there was a man named George Smith who was literally the first person to crack this code. So imagine we need to wrap our heads around what Sumerian is. Sumerian is, is, is a language that came out of the Sumerian civilization where most of these tablets were, were written. It is the birthplace, I believe, all of everything came from. And in that region, um, they mention how... Um, I, got, I got off my track and train of thought. What was I talking about for a second there? With the, the Sumerian text with George Smith? Yeah, you thank studying? you, thank you. What they, what they found was that the, the Sumerian civilization, the language they used, is what's called the language isolate. Okay. Meaning that the language doesn't share characteristics with any other language on earth, which is uh, extremely unusual. Almost all other languages share similarities. Like, for instance, what we're going to discover is that Greek shares similarities with Armenian, which is where this region is. Mm. Okay. So Sumerian is an ancient language that eventually, about 2,000 years ago, died out and no one on earth knew how to speak it. That's what we're talking about. If you want to know what an alien language is, it's Sumerian. We have no idea where it came from. It shares no similarities with any other languages on earth. And But it's spoken by a human mouth, so it's an ability that we can make. The people that wrote it were destroyed. And so much such a long period went 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 on between that that all humans on earth forgot how to read it or speak it. All humans. At that point in 1848, when these tablets were discovered, there wasn't anyone on the earth that knew how to read it. Gold, and I, that's a stat I want people to look up. So how do we read it now? How do we So a man it? came along who is my, one of my greatest heroes and I write about and I talk about how I want him to become remembered in the way he should. Mm. His name was George Smith. George Smith was a, a true genius. He was obsessed with what I am now, with understanding this ancient story and how in 1849, Austin Henry Laird went to the, 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 what's today known as Mosul, but it was originally called Nineveh, and he found the greatest library ever amassed in, in history. Iraq. Yes. It makes the li Library of Alexandria look like nothing. He found what's called the Asher Bonapal Library, and it contained over 50,000 cuneiform tablets. Okay? The greatest library ever amassed in history, and the second greatest library ever amassed in history we're going to get to in a minute called Ebla. And that's going so to connect the whole thing. you don't even have Alexandria top two. <laughs> Alexand <laughs> Alexandria to me is non, is non -sub -sub substantial compared to this. Really? Yes. Because people talk about the, the burning of human intelligence that happened when that thing burned down. They were paper. I mean, yeah, there, there was, I imagine, some good wealth of knowledge there. But again, paper can only survive so long. You're, you're talking about carrying down written records on paper. I am always suspect of that, always. Mm. But if you're going to go to the great lengths of creating tablets that mimic each other, and that's what I want to make clear. I have translated using the best translators like George Smith, and I want to tell a story in a second, on a tablet that's from like the Sumerian civilization. And then there's a tablet, say, from the Babylonians that came a thousand years later. has the same story. Mm. When you mesh the same stories together and you find common similarities, it starts to become very credible. When you say you've translated a bunch of this stuff, is this from things you're able to access at home or sometimes traveling to areas where you have to look at I it? am learning to read Sumerian right now. It's not an easy task. I've and been working did, on it for about eight months now. And how did he figure out? Thank you. Yeah, that's the great point. So he's, this huge library is found by Austin Henry Laird. Doesn't know how to read Sumerian at all. Just finds the library. Yeah. Right? They get them all together. They ship them to, to England to the University of Oxford. George Makes Smith sense. sits in a room for God knows how long, staring at these and reading everything he can and trying to figure it out. And it's described that just out of nowhere, one day he's in his office and he just figures it out. <laughs> it, okay? Here's what's weird. Sumerian doesn't have an alphabet. So how's it written? So every language in the world has an alphabet. Sumerian is based on symbols only. 
So if you have a, a phrase, it references something very specific and it can essentially only that phrase means that one thing. So he had to try to figure out what every word meant. Not because in, in languages, when you're trying to dis decipher them now, it's not that hard. I mean, relatively, what you do is you, sure. once you figure out the base, the base alphabet, you then can figure the rest out. Without that, they had no knowledge of how to do that. So I'm going to put a picture of yeah. Sumerian text in the corner of the screen. Thank you. So it's, to me, I mean, hieroglyphics in a way. Kind of. They're similar to hieroglyphics, except they are more like wedges. Mm. Okay? It's like wedged writing. And so one day he hieroglyphics goes, Hieroglyphics are, like, are more like creating symbols like they show snakes and like they have symbols for things, right? Right. But these are more, yeah, okay. So one day he just goes, Eureka, and he's, he's got He it. screams. It's described how he's in, he's in the office and he screams. I mean, think about, imagine cracking a code of a language that nobody's spoken in 2,000 years. Oh, it's That be, contains yeah. the greatest library in human history ever amassed. But how do you know you're right, too? That's well, so he cracks the first tablet ever, ever. The first set of tablets was the Epic of Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. He cracks it and he starts what he, he's not. He's a very smart man. I love his books. He's a genius. What he did was he took... Assyrian and Babylonian and Akkadian that are not Sumerian. They're, they're written in cuneiform, meaning the wedges, but they're not the same language. Mm. He took the similarities in those stories and he compared it to Sumerian and he matched them up. Uh. He got so smart. He realized, whoa, whoa, wait. So in Babylonian, this is the word for mountain and it's referencing the same place in these tablets. He figured it out. He's like a genius. Oh, shit. Yeah. He figured out, he literally uncovered something that nobody has figured out so in thousands of So in a way, he's using all, not to oversimplify yeah. this, but he's using geography to... And previous similarities in, in I wouldn't, I'm not going to say the languages have similarities, but mm. the locations are. So like, he takes Babylonian or Akkadian, and he matches up things that are the same. He can figure it out using a known language, and then backpedal, and then fill in the gaps. He's just like a genius. Yeah. So he cracks the code. He cracks the Epic of Gilgamesh. And then other experts come after and confirm everything that he had said. Other experts that had, had, had taught on, studied on their own, they're called the Syriologists, even though they're, they're studying Sumerian. Sure. And those names are like Samuel Kramer and Stephanie Daly. And these guys came along um, and they, they took his translations and either like tweaked it slightly or confirmed everything but he had how can they, said. All right, so to play skeptic here, yeah. how can they confirm when there's only one source in the first place? You don't have anything to compare it against. As things went along and other experts were able to study these, I want to give you a time frame of how different this is. George Smith translated these in like 1850. Okay. All right. Like 1850 to 1860, somewhere in that time period. Um, Stephanie Daly and Samuel Kramer didn't come for like 100 years later. Mm. This isn't like right after. This is a, a body of study that is like over great amounts of time, right? So they confirm everything that he states. So then I, as someone who wants to know the truth, looks at this at a lens that they're not looking at at all. Because it's 1970s and 80s and this is all myth and it's not real. Remember? Yeah. And that's very important to point out. Even through the lens, and I love Stephanie Daly, and I don't think she's ever going to listen to this, but if she does, <laughs> um, I, I have, no, I have no, no ill manner to understand why they went down the route they were. They're academics. They, they, you, you have to. I understand. What do you mean you have to? If you were to read these tablets and be like, I think these were really cities that were actually real and they're from like an older time period, no. Because it gets shut down. The body of history that exists right now is extremely controlled. Everything fits into a 6,000 year window and that none of these advanced civilizations or anything we're talking about exists. That is such a disgrace. I mean, yes. I, I just don't, God, the stupidity of smart people. I will never understand it. You know, and it's not to say like, it's not to say that a guy like you or other people looking at this stuff can't find evidence that is then later refuted by better evidence. Yeah. That's the whole fucking point. <laughs> I don't understand. Like, it pisses me off when, when I hear about scientists in anything. I don't care if it's this, other forms of history, yeah. medicine, whatever it is. Historians, all, the academics. I'm sorry, not scientists. The academics. 
yeah that shut down debate or shut down like the the entrance of new things because it's going to be peer review fuck your peer review right fuck your peer review if people especially in today's world well i'm sorry i'm going off right here but this <laughs> okay. I, I think about this a lot like yeah especially in today's world where there is ultimate access to so many things through the click of a button where people can go and actually review things for themselves it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be absolute idiots out there who come up with stuff that makes no sense yeah. of course yeah, i of know course. that but you're telling me across a whole population that's what it's going to no there's going to be people who actually discover things and when you talk about you were telling a story earlier about who was it not not plato was it socrates was poisoned by his own people for speaking out yeah his government okay so he was viewed as like an academic or something he was like that. he was speaking out where he was not supposed to you but know? still someone some asshole who knew shit about fuck decided to murder that guy because they didn't like what he said and they had power what's different now and he's one of the smartest most enlightened men that ever lived in history and they killed him i just that's why plato did what he did remember it's history because repeating itself. plato was so worried yeah. well it's about to get worse how when I show you these sites and I tell you what happened to them. All right, let's go. Okay, so I take the best translators in the world. I cross-reference every version of these tablets and I create basically a document taking all, I took every single city, everything mentioned as different time periods, as kings and, and bloodlines. I took the whole thing. This is, this is about a year ago and I created a working timeline. If you want to show it, you can. I have a website. Yeah. It's thestageoftime.com. Good little plug there, too. Yeah, and, um, and, and you'll see a tab on there called uh, something. You'll see author and then timelines right before it. Books from the author, ancient texts and yeah. timelines. Yeah, and then scroll all the way to the very bottom. And so if people want to read these texts that I'm talking about, I have them right on there. 200,000 year time yeah. on civilization? Yeah. All right, I'm going to stick that in the corner of the screen okay. so that we have it. So it's I, behind you right now. I create that based on this understanding and seeking of trying to recreate the ancient world from uh -huh. not having a, a, a limitation. So I do need to mention this because I think it's important based on your rant. <laughs> I... um. Imagine you you go you go to school and you work really hard to be an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. Like you really you spend you're in debt financially or whatever, you blah blah blah. You get to go to these sites, you're digging around. If you even speak up about an alternative theory or something that doesn't fit, you're laughed out and you lose every bit of credibility and then you yes. probably would be forgotten in history or whatever because you probably would be so um hurt by that. And then we, we know that people like Graham Hancock has take have taken brutal hits from the mainstream academic yes. world over this. And so people think that this is just willy nilly, like we can just throw this out there. No, like this is, this is the doctrine of history protected, maintained and controlled and guarded. That's why people like Zahi Awas in Egypt will refute any evidence and, and conversations with like Graham Hancock about how the great pyramids have no pharaohs and how there's all these aspects that don't align with what we're talking about. They fiercely fight that narrative, fiercely. Okay, and that, but that leads to what we're about to do because I don't want us to all hate on every single ac academic because I know that maybe they didn't have the guts to stand up, but I also wasn't, maybe it wasn't the right time. Now we're at this yeah, time where yeah. people are open to hear it and it's yeah, building I, something. I don't, and, and I'm glad you say that because what I don't want to do, and I'm guilty of it sometimes by accident, I'd like to think a lot of it's by accident, but... <laughs> You don't want to paint everyone with one brush. When I say that and I refer to like the academics or something, I'm referring to the people who are most vociferously going out of their way to tell these people to yes. fuck off. And and I don't and that those people, for instance, and I, I do want to call him out. I think Zahi Was is the best example that That's exists. That's that Egyptian guy. He he protects fiercely the old Egyptian paradigm, which has arguably the most amount of evidence that it's not true there. Yeah, that guy can suck a dick. He sucks. What, what really stinks, though, and I know that people who are listening to this are going to know, they show images, like, I don't know if you know this, but the Sphinx has at least three entrances. Did you know that? No. You can pull it up right now. Look okay. at um, entrances to Sphinx. There's one on the head, there's one on the bottom um, of below the leg, and there's one on the front, underneath the front of the body. All right, we'll put this in the corner. Now, screen. Zahi Was has been shown... Which um, one? Well, there's a bunch. Yeah, scroll down, you'll find more. Uh, do, do, do. Where's the head one? We need to find one on the head. Uh, right there? No, I need you to find one that says, um, there, right there. Okay. That's the head of the Sphinx. Now, this isn't, this. if anybody doesn't believe this, like, go look, because... 
there's images of Zahi Awas climbing down these stairs and other entrances to the underworld of Egypt. And they state they don't go anywhere and they're not of interest. So they know all about this. They know all about these places and it's just becomes stupid. Do you think he's a front then? Yeah. Oh, they, they, they hire people to be the head of archaeology regions that will play the game and are part of a very specific type of person. Or they beat them in, into subsistence. Or they, or they threaten them to, to bring a bunch of junk that they had in their life to be exposed or something. <laughs> it's true and it's, and it's unfortunate, but it's the way it is all across the world. And if anybody thinks, well, how come this guy that's like, you know, only 39 that blah, blah, blah. Like, how can I discover what we're about to talk about? Because I'm not held back by the things that they are. Mm. And I can just go wherever the evidence goes and go wherever I need to. Well, who's to say they won't stop you? Well, and if I get big enough, we'll see. <laughs> but it, it is, I just don't think that the same system of silencing potentially people and that, I don't know if that exists anymore. And what we're about to get into you're going to see how insane this is that it's like, it's so obvious that this is deliberate, that it's not like a hypothetical anymore. Mm. And I think that's an important thing to get across because I don't want to go down too far down the rabbit hole of conspiracies and things that are held back, but it's just very obvious in this way that what we're about to talk about and not even the new discoveries, the other stuff that was started this for me, um, is we should we're not allowed to talk about it. Mm. That's the really what it comes down to. Right before we get into it though, can can we just stop for one yeah. sec? I gotta go to the bathroom. Yeah. All right. All right, we're back. Okay, so I think the first place we have to start is, as I mentioned, in studying a, around a hundred to one hundred fifty of these tablets from the Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian civilizations. <clears throat> I once I knew the translations were as accurate as possible, I then went on a crusade. And you showed that timeline that I had before, yeah, I still have the 200,000-year timeline. Mm -hmm. My crusade began with the idea that I wanted to recreate the ancient world and the story of history from the best available evidence we can. And that I firmly believed that the information within these tablets um, from Mesopotamia was being ignored is essentially what the focus became. Because mainstream thought it was a myth and a legend, it wasn't real. The crusade for me was to try to understand how these, this civilization that emerged that was supposedly the first ever on earth, ever, and, that, and we'll get into that in a second, but how that led to everything else. Mm. That's what this is all about. It's about putting breadcrumbs together in puzzle pieces to recreate history in a way where we don't only, not only are we shattering paradigms, but we're paving a completely new road that's never been paved. I have a quick question just before you go all the way deep on yeah. that, because it's been permeating throughout this whole time where I'm like, well, where could this tie in? Evolutionarily, if we're okay. talking about multiple different generations across catastrophe, it means that human beings were something very close to us across these different spectrums of time existed meaning we evolved obviously a very, very long time ago. So do yeah. you have any thoughts on when exactly that happened and what yeah. the first parts of like what we would consider air quotes, like human, yeah. uh, I guess like presence on this planet? The reason why I, I did a 200,000 year timeline is not just circumstantial evidence. What we find, and I really would encourage people to look into the work of Lloyd Pye. Lloyd, like P-I? P-Y-E. P-Y-E. He yeah. was a genius in my mind. And I don't agree with everything he said in regards to some, let's say some of what he connected with ancient Sumer and everything. But what he was an expert on is looking at genetic traits of humans. He basically was an expert at studying genetic traits and looking for diversions within our, our mm. the lines of humans. And what he found was that 200,000 years ago, supposedly the exact uh, creation of the first city and this th maybe even referencing the whole like Adam and Eve type of story, just the creation, some, some kind of a taking a, a blueprint of a human, like a Neanderthal Denis Denisovium and somehow something else completely emerges. Something comes out of nowhere. That's not as related to that as we think a a as, as sure. related to Neanderthal and Denisovians, something totally different, something that is more like a child of the universe where we have 
uh, it's, it's really weird how, like, for instance, the earth has almost the exact same amount of water as we do in our body and how the, our, our blood is composed of iron. It's the same core that the earth spins. We're like perfectly designed for this earth is the best way to describe it. Yes. Like per perfect here. Okay. But not in a way where we're supposed to be hunter gathering or living primitively. We no longer, all of a sudden the hair mostly lost off our body. He just, he discusses how all of the traits that would be necessary for us to survive in the way we've been told just all of a sudden vanished. And someone would be like, well, evolutionarily, they, they really, they don't need them anymore. But no, this happened like out of nowhere. It's not like is a slow thing. And we've also never observed any kind of a primate in any stage of a change over the course of human history ever. Never. Not even one slight change where it was like converting into something else. And I'm not someone who's completely against all aspects of evolution. Sure. I want to make that clear. What I realize is that based on others is that evolution may be more based on um, the macro versus the micro. So like some, mm. for instance, I think that something, an animal, yes, can, can, can develop more hair, or change things like, yeah, those things absolutely happen. But for something to be able to, for instance, go from um, a giraffe or like a whale to us, I don't understand how that'd be possible. And I want to give an example of that. I talk about how in Australia, there's a creature there that proves that I, I believe it proves that evolution isn't exactly what we've been told. Not What's the creature? The platypus. Are you familiar with the platypus? Yes, I am familiar with the platypus. Platypus is the weirdest goddamn animal on earth. Okay? <laughs> I'll put a picture in the corner of the screen okay. for people who aren't familiar. It's a mammal that lays eggs that's poisonous. Mm. that is supposed to be like a half bird half duck it's it doesn't make sense but is it possible that something like that was through evolution and the diversity that it was across these millions of species it happened to be located in an area that evolved it to be a hybrid type animal it's potential but i want to give it an, an example for why i think that's not true okay lloyd pie pointed out this really weird thing about humans I don't know if you know this yet, but humans have 46 chromosomes and all primates have 48. All primates on I Earth. I didn't know that. Every single primate has 48 chromosomes. It has to do with packages of DNA, basically. Yes. Okay? What they found within the human, human homo sapien sapien was that there was something within our DNA where parts of it had been, like, altered. Yeah, I'm like serious. And they, what they call those alterations and those things that scientists don't know, they call it junk DNA. That's what, ah. that's what scientists call it, because when they compared every other comparable thing on Earth genetically, they found this small little area within our genetics that doesn't match anything on the planet. Is it possible that we are still too primitive, technologically speaking, to properly test something like that? Perhaps. But here's the thing that's weird. Like, like Randall says, we've been taught everything's based on gradualism, whether it's geology or genetics. In, or evolutionary changes, meaning things happen very slowly over a very long period of time. However, we know from these disasters that that's not true. We know that the Earth does go through periods when extreme things happen. It doesn't happen all the time, yeah, but it yeah, does yeah. happen, yeah. okay? Those extreme moments also seem to have occurred with us. And what I mean is, not only take the chromosome thing for a minute, like which is very, very strange, because how something like a splicing of a DNA or altering w could happen naturally... It, I've, had, I've seen no anthropologist or scientist that can explain that. It's not talked about because it's sort of like hush-hush. The yeah. whole junk DNA aspect of this, because we do share like 98% with, every, with like a cow. I really do. One, one of the types of guests I haven't had in here yeah. that I want to have in very badly is like an evolutionary biologist. Yeah, Lloyd Pye go. died though, unfortunately. Really no, sad. no, I, I, I yeah. know. I'm, I'm, talk, I'm yeah. talking about, I'm talking about like just a, a, a general one, one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to go through it. And what, what Lloyd Pye also determined, besides the chromosomes and besides the human body totally changing, structurally too, it started to take on characteristics that were um, not suitable to survive out in the in, in the wilds at all. Like what? Our ability to, like, for instance, we're not strong anymore at all. Neanderthals and Denisovians yeah. were unbelievably strong. Right. We, we, the strength of what we are is like nothing compared to what they are. The way that we have genetic diseases and the way our bone structure is and everything, it's like it was designed in a way to, to function for a different reason, to not be living off the land, 
to function as something with like a greater purpose yes. is the way I would describe yes. it. Okay. And what Lloyd discovered was that 200,000 years ago, the human brain more than doubled in size. 200,000 years ago. At once. Yes. Out of nowhere. And then we're, we go to places like Gobekli Tepe to bring it back home to that. They radiocarbon date those pillars to be 11,600 years old. But they find, this is what's fascinating, that when they dig down through the layers underneath Gobekli Tepe to try to like basically have a time timeline of figuring out sure. when things happened, they find something so unusual that you're never going to hear anyone mainstream talking about it. They find that at the Quebecly level, te- Quebecly level, that they had this advanced, I mean, with agriculture and other things that came out of nowhere. Like literally, there's like a layer where all of a sudden agriculture and all these things start happening. And then the layer right below it, they find hunter-gatherer evidence. Right. So I, I've heard Graham talk about yes. this a ton. So one of the questions there would be, is there, first of all, can you define for people who are, again, basically unfamiliar with this, yeah. what you mean when you say hunter-gatherer, and then we'll go okay. off something So there. there was, just like there are, is today, with all the advancement we have as humans and flying around with jets, there are still very remote places in the world where people have no technology. Yes. And live literally like in another world. Yeah, what's one of the examples? There's an in- island off of India that is yes. famous because literally they like killed someone in the past or something, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, like you can't even approach yeah. it. And so... That same thing was going on then, but to a greater degree. Okay. I want to point that out. It's like there was two things going on at the same time, which is so confusing, which is why so much of this is getting getting meshed together. Well, if think about it, though, too, because sometimes I get confused why we get confused by this. Like, like yeah. human beings are so interconnected because there's fucking 8 billion of us, and like we yeah. have technology and can communicate yeah. all over the world. Only 400, 500 years ago, guys were sailing across into the goddamn abyss to fucking find shit that they knew nothing about. And when we look at other species, like be it like the on the monkey side, right? There's different types who maybe some of them don't communicate with each other and don't recognize the 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 sameness right, of each yeah, other, right? Yeah, You've heard that. about like chimps eating monkeys yes, and stuff like yes. that. So they seem like different, like disconnected. What's to say that at some point when there was a lower number of humans at a at a much smaller touch point of communication, why they wouldn't recognize a human as another human, which we are literally, I think, seeing when you talk about like those people on those islands and stuff who are just like, oh, someone comes on, like kill it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you see this in the Amazon still yeah. to this day. Yeah. I think that I think that what was going on was confusing to them. Mm. I think that what was going on is not like now. Like those people in those islands, they do know we exist. They, these people didn't know what was happening there. Imagine there's a primitive type of person that's been here for 100,000 years or more. Wandering around, right? Mm -hmm. Living in caves, killing animals, like trying to survive and imagine if all of a sudden this area of Sumer Mesopotamia this emergence of a different human comes like out of nowhere and it's not related to evolutionary means so what are you getting at that it could be related to I firmly believe after studying the tablets to the degree that I as extensive as I possibly can they echo the same thing over it's like it's almost it's almost over the top they they try to compete for claim like for instance there's babylonian tablets and there's sumerian tablets and akkadian they're from different time periods but in them it's kind of funny because like there's a babylonian version of the same tablet if we like the enuma elish or something it's called in terms of enuma elish for babylon and then in, in sumer and what we find is that they try to claim ownership for creation of humans in different tablets for different people so like Bel Marduk I mentioned, and by the way, I want to correct what I said before. I couldn't remember the name of the conqueror of, of, of Babylon. His name was Cygnus the Great, okay? Mm. Cygnus the Great con- famously conquered Babylon for like the first time in history because it was a very powerful empire. And he wrote about how he was deathly afraid of their deity, Bel Marduk. And I, I want to bring it back to that again. Not as like, not as an archetype of nature, but he was afraid of him. Mm. He said that. And so when he conquered Babylon... The, it's described how when they went into the city, they like didn't touch anything. I'm serious. They didn't ransack or do anything because he was deathly afraid of these gods. Discuss how you, if you uh, take a temple and like destroy it or something, it's the ultimate thing you could do here to be a, to, yeah. to be bad, right? So 
he comes in, he conquers Babylon, and he's like, shh, like, like tiptoe around, like take some treasure, and then r rule the region. But he was really afraid of him. And, and people should go read his memoirs and like talking about it. The point I'm trying to make is in the Enuma Elish, he takes credit for creating humanity. Bel Marduk. Bel means ruler. Bel Marduk. And in the Sumerian versions, his father Enki takes credit for creation of humans. The point is they're competing. It's not like there's one group saying this. The same group is trying to compete to be like the all supreme. Like they're trying to be God here. How much of what you're saying right now is based on, I don't even know. If not you, opinion? If, but no, based... no, no, no. I'm not going to say that. I don't even know if you can properly ask this question because I don't know if anyone, including you, would have a way of determining yeah. the answer. But like, I always try to think of like separation from source. Yeah. So like if Belmar Duke, in this case, like said what he said and I created humans and then the person who was who he was saying that to, or among the people, yes. wrote it down Barocious. right there. And His name is Barocious. Okay, Barocious. Are we reading Barocious's first person, allegedly, air quotes, account yeah. of what so, he's saying? And th what's fascinating is that we know that it came over a thousand years later. So it means What came that a thousand years later? This, their version of the story, writing it down on so, the tablets. So they there, there became... This, this is important to understand because it has directly to do with the influences of these new these regions we're about to talk about and the patron gods that then created them because it seemed like there was a war going on with some of them over over competing and we know that because there's a there's a set of tablets called Enki and the New World Order and in that it discusses how some of these gods like Anana and Enki and Enlil are given dom domains and regions of the world to run I'm telling mm -hmm. you this stuff is like mind blowing and it talks about how Anana is unhappy because she's got the Indus Valley in that region of India and up through that region. And he's reminding her of, of that. It's important that she, that she still has that and that and teaching her a lesson that it's not always about like wanting more or something basically. Right. But the, the thing that's like so strange is that they have conversations and very detailed descriptions that it would, to me would be impossible if it was just planets or aspects of our solar system or aspects of nature. Those do exist. Okay. There are gods represented as storm gods and different things. Sure. And those are like archetypes of nature, but there's something else going on too. There's something else that I'm saying is where we came from. They, and I, you led me to this point. And I got to say it just because it's important, but George Smith at the end of his, his first book called The Chaldean Account of Genesis, highly recommend. It's like one of the most amazing books ever written in history. At the end of his book, and remember, this is like 1871. Sure, yeah. It's like nobody is, understands any of this yet. There's not really a control system anymore at, at that point. Not in history. They didn't understand anything. And he was like trying to figure things out. Okay, not in history. Okay. No, no, I meant in history. Like, for instance, they had no idea where to, where to put this. Or Egypt, it was sort of trying to yeah. figure it out. Right? Yeah, I, okay. I understand what you're saying. Go ahead. So George Smith, at the end of the book... Chaldean account of Genesis says this like incredible line where he says he clearly shows confusion over the Anuna. And, and the, the, just to be clear, the Anuna is the Sumerian term for their gods. Anunnaki is the later Akkadian and Babylonian term. So the original term was called the Anuna. Now, on or Anu, I've determined is God. And I know a lot of people might not like that, but it's, I've studied every tablets in the the descriptions of it and the comparisons of what it. What leads you to that conclusion? I mean, that's a big conclusion. They, they're not as different as we think. We're not talking about a non, it's not a competing aspect where I'm like, they're saying God doesn't exist. That's what I'm trying to say. It, because a lot of people will, will get very mad, especially religious groups, when any of this is brought up because then they're, it's like they're refuting that any, some kind of a prime creator or source e exists. Of course. What? Well, yeah. Okay. So... The more descriptions you learn of this Anu or on, or on, which is where Anuna, the word came from, Anunnaki came from the word Anu or on, and basically it means children of God. They're, they're like fractals of the actual source. And that's why it claims that they're, they're, the, they're, they're direct descendants or sons or daughters of, of On, because On or Anu is God. And so it leads you down to this very, very difficult rabbit hole because what, what George Smith points out that's really confusing is that 
it talks about how they come at different time periods in history. And he says that in the book. And man, this is like the literally the greatest genius in the Syrian, the Sumerian, all Sumerian history of, of all time. And he before you know they're sidestrapped from certain ideas, he notices that the Enuma Elish talks about how they somehow apparently came here before the earth is like it is now. It describes how it was like it was like chaos, volcanoes everywhere. There was like it describes it as having no life. So it's during one of those periods. Literally billions of years ago, potentially. Billions. Wait, hold on a minute. Yeah, we yeah. just skipped I'm, a lot. I know. I just threw that out there. And I'm. how else can we what explain it? What makes you it? say billions? Because they describe how there's no life on Earth. None. Like none. Yeah, but Not why? even microbes. Not even microbes. So how do they... Because they're God creatures, they survive? No, they didn't come from here. I know. It says Because they're God creatures, they survive. Apparently the Earth... And I've come to the conclusion that... Listen, as far as we know of any planet, we don't know of any planets in, in the in the known universe that have as much quartz as Earth does. Quartz. Okay. Quartz seems to be, again, all those megaliths they build with is the highest concentration of quartz of any stone they can. Quartz seems to be this resonant energy of creation. It's literally like if you had, it's like we're on a giant crystal. If you look oh at the God. silica content of Earth, like for instance, if you go down to a beach that's non-coral based, like a beach of sand, and you pick up a, a, a big scoop of sand, like 90% of it's quartz. Because silica is the most common element on this planet. Quartz is silica. Silica is used entirely for time keeping. And you're saying it's like the material A giant creation. crystal. It's like a giant crystal here. So how did... I know, I just blew hold your on. mind. Yeah, hold you on. did. You're breaking my brain right now. Okay, hold so on. So <laughs> how does that... Be, it, does it come back to what I was insinuating a minute ago like it's because they're like sent by a god-like yeah. creature that they survived without an ability to have anything to eat and... they're not physical beings they can oh, be wait. physical if they want to they discuss, discuss it as that what not only the that fuck? they can incarnate as a human and be a human here and that's why we've, I, I believe we've had great humans throughout history that are like non-human we are them but they're like a super version of us we're like the children of them, and we're we're like creator gods of the universe. And then, and the funny thing is that this this reality has been created here, where we are. It seems like the purpose of it is to make us forget that, and to keep us in a very simplistic mindset, in a very sim simplistic type of distraction, and doing all these basic things. Is I think the whole idea, and I take this back to something called it's a Gnostic text called uh, the Nag Hammadi. And it talks about in that how there's this jealous God of, of here that talks about how he's, he, he like almost hates humanity, how we became so powerful and we weren't supposed to be that it says he casts us down into the lowest form of matter so that we could, we could be like in turmoil as, as a, like a way to, we have to force, we have to work our way back up again. To, to eventually become what we be started as. This is starting to get like karmaic. Yeah. I'm telling you, the whole thing is, it gets, gets to the point where it's hard to like be around people because it gets so deep and you start like, it, it like disrupts all of reality. You st and because the more they talk about it, they say, are you ready for this, this line that's like... Probably not, but go ahead. In the Atrahasis, it's the tablet we're about to go into all this. It talks about the creation of humans and it specifically it says that we, it says, Enki, you were, you were tasked with creating humanity to relieve the toil of us, mm. the toil, okay? And it talks about, it says, where you went, you were to, un ready for this? I want you to think about this for a second. It's the most profound single line I've ever seen in any, any of these tablets. And it's mentioned more than once. It says, where you went, you were to undo the chain and set us free. So what does that insinuate to you? Well, in the legend of Atana, we learned that Enki ended up taking up a role in the underworld. This is where it's about to get even more bizarre. So now we're getting heaven and hell shit. They start talking about how they like assumed roles within reality and like would could command and control over them. They're not what we think. It's described that they came here in the Enuma Elish and altered the entire planet so that life could start. <laughs> right? And then George Smith goes on to say, well, but then they just disappear for a, a billion years. And then they just show up to create humanity when it's time. Wrap your head around that. When it's time. 
when the when all of a sudden we don't have dinosaurs running around the world eating everyone and all of a sudden our planet becomes um, sustainable for life like on a way that mammals can can continue here Denisovians and Neanderthals Neanderthal seem to have led the way towards something that was like a plan how long ago again did they say the dinosaurs 65 million years ago I thought and when I get into my binary work stuff and I talk about you with you with the dark star and how potentially it may have exploded 65 million years ago and you were talking about the initial a few minutes back you had said I think this is referring to like some of the what's the name of the god again Enki no, or Enlil? The, the other one. Oh, Bel Marduk. Yeah. Bel Marduk. Yeah. That's could have the been, son of Enki. Your quote was it could have been billions of years ago. Or a billion. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, won't, okay. I won't just say right, billions. I'll say a billion. Up, but either way, the yeah. point remains. Yeah. So we're talking way before the Time were doesn't any dinosaurs exist for them. Here. Time doesn't exist. Oh if you are God. if you are a multidimensional being and you exist in other realms of reality, it's called the fourth and fifth dimension. This is where we're going to get into physics. I wish Michio Kaku was sitting next to us. Well, this is the shit he was blowing my mind right? with, with the multiple people walking in the exactly. room. Exactly. Okay. So what we're talking about is we exist in the third dimensional reality realm. This is a realm of the physical material world. It's the only realm that the physical material world exists in, its, in that totality. Meaning that time here is in linear form because of organic breakdown. E entropy. I, Essentially, entropy is the reason why things in the third dimensional reality anything that's physical always breaks down i have a question on this yeah. for you personally sure when you start talking about things like this that get into physics yeah and like the actual science of stuff obviously you do a ton of research across yeah. history i'm not an expert and, i just want to point that out okay so what my question was going to be you're basing everything you're saying like right now based off the people like the Mich like the Michus of the world. The best physicists in the world that are willing, like, for instance, I want to just give a shout out to Michio Kaku because he, to me, is the greatest physicist that's ever lived only because of one thing. Yeah, he's as brilliant as all the others, but he's willing to talk outside the box about what's possible out there, the, the paradoxes mm -hmm. that exist in our universe with the extraterrestrial life and possibility. He's, sm he's like so willing to just not be clamped down by something that he's the only one in my opinion that's that's just is willing to talk about that in an open way and there's a lot of physicists who hate him for it i, know I stay that. out of that like, i know like whole thing i obviously like the guy a that's lot. why i admire True him gentleman so much. Yes. awesome dude and blows my mind but yeah. one of the reasons i think they attack him well there's two things there First is kind of what you're getting at right there, which is that he will look at things beyond what we can even process or test in and existence. And put them together. And, yeah. and people will say, you're going so far, it's yeah. loony, and you're just talking out of your ass about whatever. I disagree that he's talking out of his ass. Yeah. I think he's just thinking outside the box. Yeah. And secondly, you're talking about a guy who for, I don't know how long, call it like 30, 40 years in that area, worked on the science hardcore like as a scientist yes and now i mean he's he's an older guy yeah. he's like yeah. 76 Still years brilliant, old though. right it's amazing he's a machine yeah. like you'd never know it but you know for the last 20 years it seems like give or take he has given his life to being the and he said this like i'm a popularizer of science i'm someone who goes out and discusses it to so that the kids can get yeah. interested in, in it and everything and from the perspective of the fact that we have so many so many young people in our society who are not interested in math yeah. and science, people like Michu are so yeah. goddamn important. Make it exciting. Make yes. it something that's like fascinating. Yes. So that's where, and I understand yeah. where he gets a lot of attention because he's on TV and stuff and people get jealous of that. Like it's a human thing. I get it. I, I think it's weird and you shouldn't, you should never get that way, but people get that way. But, you know, to, to whitewash like the work he's done and what he's doing now, I, I, I don't I don't agree with it. And I, I I think it's wrong. But that, that's the whole point of why I admire him so much. Because these are pioneers in their field that are willing to go above and beyond to challenge a very tightly controlled narrative. And it's 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 been like that for a long time. And then people accuse him of being tightly controlled too, which that's what I mean. Like no matter what, you're not gonna be able to win. But when I call when I go on a rant like I did yeah. a little bit ago those types of people are the ones who are going out of their way yes. to vociferously shut everyone down and tell them to fuck yeah. off. And, 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 and the thing that's amazing is Michio Kaku, I know he's like an incredibly smart guy, he realizes that the greatest contribution you can possibly make here is to be remembered. Mm. There's nothing else you can do but be remembered in a positive way. And so Michio Kaku, I bet you he made a decision at one point that he's like, I'm going to just speak the truth of what I feel and because I want 
I bet you he wants to shift our thinking towards something greater, to shift oh, our yeah, thinking towards something sure. where we incorporate more, more ideas of what could be and what, yeah. how amazing the universe is. It really is. Yeah, I kind of wonder. I mean, I think everyone does at a human level. Like they they think about how they're going to be remembered and stuff like that. I think it's a human thing. But but, but then the opposite is true though, where they don't want to be take a chance and then lose everything they sure, worked for. So it's like sure. a, it's like a sword. It's like a tight edge, like a really narrow sword to try to right. f to follow that. Great point. So. Um, what I'm trying to, I don't remember where we were. Do you remember where we were at? We were talking about the Anuna and like the whole idea. They seem to have took up roles within our reality. And this is yes, why yes, you were so talking about many the people, interdimensional stuff. And yeah. I, so many people are so obsessed with the whole UFO alien phenomenon right now. And I, I kind of chuckle because I absolutely believe there's beings all throughout the universe. It's vast. Of course. Of course there is. Statistically, but I it's think that there's not. We're sort of looking right at them. We are them. And they're all throughout our murals and depictions and talking about us. We're looking in the wrong place, in my opinion. You think it's all here? I think that any any extraterrestrial species who's incredibly advanced that could possibly get here through some means, whether it's linearly through through star system travel or through some kind of a gateway or portal, it'd be more like there's an inherent responsibility that's always put on top of that when you reach that level. I think Star Trek nailed that. And I think that if you, any group would, oh, would, would always have that inherent responsibility to watch without us ever knowing we, that, that they're there. Why would they ever just willy nilly fly around and pollute a timeline with people and start and do that? It's an inherent responsibility that's been, that's been grown over the course of what? That civilization's ability to get to where they were after a hundred thousand years or whatever. Like we, yeah. I think we're just a little bit too simplistic with our thinking. And so... Yeah, I bet you we're being watched by all over the cosmos. Absolutely. I think I bet you we're like a reality show. Like I said to you last night, it's like a bunch of angels all killing each other. But what you're also talking about, and, and maybe I'm losing it in the timeline of yeah. us jumping around here, but what you're talking about with, you know, an ancient like God people sent here, that that is an alien. And then if we are just, if some of us are descendants right. of them, and then the rest of us are just some right. species that formed, I'm getting real meta here. Yeah, sorry. yeah then like there could be a small group of them among us. Right. And I, I think that the challenge is, I guess I just don't like polluted terms. You don't like what? Polluted terms. The what word alien has become so polluted oh, okay. that I just, I almost don't even want to say it anymore because I, what, the thing I don't believe <laughs> is I do not believe they arrived here on ships and stuff like that. And I don't believe that because the tablets, these beings that are described in this that created us they don't need any of that it just it's described how time doesn't exist for them that's why they could come here a billion years ago and then come during different time period because when you're in the fifth dimension time doesn't exist at all it's not it's nothing so time wouldn't have you wouldn't be waiting around like watching your clock everything would literally happen only in the moment do you think it's possible i love this topic i'm really clear yeah. here do you think it's possible that there's some form of a controlled simulation. I actually don't like using the word simulation there. I know where you're going there, 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 but yeah. do, you, do you think it's possible that there's some sort of like controlled experiment for things to be seen on, on rare occasions by different people around the world in a consistent yes. basis where they can make a similar description yes. and people really saw what they saw such that, you know, the, the instant – the instant detraction from like any of the arguments on UFOs is like, oh, well, if these civilizations were so smart, why the fuck would they ever be yeah. seen? And it's something I throw out there all the yeah. time too. I always say, I think they're doing it on purpose. Yeah. So do you think there could be, there could be things driven from things on this planet that are yeah. doing those things on purpose? Yeah, and, and it's I not just like, <laughs> oh, the CIA is doing a couple experiments. Yeah. It's like yeah, actually yeah. something else. The best way I can describe it, and this is very unsettling for people, is that Source creation that created everything in the universe created it perfectly. Source creation? God. Okay. There is a perfection to everything. If there wasn't, n everything would collapse and just destroy itself. Everything is perfect. I want to give you an example. And I don't want to get too far off where we were, though. Okay? And let's... If, uh, actually? Yeah. Where were we exactly? We are going to talk about how, um, how these beings are related to source, but how they altered our reality in a way that we're almost like we are in some kind of a simulation. 
Yeah, that's a good point to bring to make sure we keep I'm literally that. Literally writing that down. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I'm gonna say this at, for all the people at home. One of the things about you, and you and I were talking about this last night at dinner, is that you have so much, forget like the timeline and how yeah, long Yeah, we haven't it even is. done this. Yeah. There's so much yeah. history that you'll go through and stuff. So when you do podcasts, sometimes people get frustrated if like the host accidentally gets you off something and yeah. you don't come back. So I want to make sure we're gonna like, come if back. you're going to do yeah. context, we're going to come yeah, back. Yeah, we're going to come back, guys. Don't worry. There's a lot to tie back. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to come back. I promise. We haven't even gotten into the to, to the heart of what or the whole point of this conversation is. But I think this is context we need to understand. And I know that this is overwhelming to some, but if we don't lay it out, what we're about to talk about won't really it won't really make the same type of understanding or make sense the same way. Okay. Our earth, our earth and this of the universe in the way that everything moves, the way that elements come together, and the way that everything is is perfect. I once saw a statistic, and I don't remember exactly what it is, but if anything in the physical aspect of our understanding of the universe was even slightly like 0. .00001 different or something, everything would like collapse and crash into each other. Yeah, it's perfectly tuned. Everything yeah. is perfect, right? Now, imagine you're someone who comes to visit Earth, right? And you're learning about the biome systems here in the environments, and, you, and you're like, okay, so right now we're, um, we're in the, on the East Coast. We in in summertime, spring, and summer, the leaves come out and the trees all do their thing. And then, what happens at fall? The leaves fall to the ground. They create the essential components of all life continuing at that point. Organic matter breaking down. Yes, is the only reason why life can survive here. It, but it, but so perfect though the way that plants do with oxygen and carbon dioxide and the way that they drop and then another everything grows based on this cycles of death and rebirth and everything is perfect on this earth except for us we are something that's an anomaly it seems strange like we're here almost like we're visitors and we're trying to figure it out and the way that i've described it as is we seem more like stewards of the earth than anything else is that we're supposed to be here taking care of it and that's perhaps why we were created in the first place this is where it's leading back to this because in the tablets it talks about how there was this lower group of these gods called the ajigi i-g-i-g-i i-g-i-g-i okay? okay and that they were creating temples and clearing river channels in the euphrates and tigris before we were here it does it clearly states that it says that before any mankind was here they were like demigod gods that were doing the work for these like overlord gods. Yes. That's the best way I can describe it. Powerful beings that have a great interest in this place. And, and as I said, George Smith, his quote is, they seem to come backwards and forwards in time. Here though, mm. they have a great interest in here. And they talk about how they're always like fighting against the chaos of nature to alter it to, the, to, to what they want. Now, getting back to what we were saying, is that the Ajiji eventually revolted. That's what it says in the Atrahasis. It's, an, it's a, one of the almost ancient tablets from Sumer. And most of what we're gonna be talking about comes from the Atrahasis. By far my favorite tablet. And it states that the Ajiji revolted, didn't wanna do work in this physical realm anymore. Imagine, think about realms for a minute. They didn't wanna do that anymore. It's like almost like lower work. And so they decided um, to create humanity based on their gifts, but so we could toil, they said do the work of the yes. gods okay yes. so we are created to do everything here infrastructure taking care of the river channels because these people don't understand that they talk about it all the time because if you have a river channel in an arid area the euphrates and tigris and you don't clear it out it'll fill with silt and you can't use it anymore so they mm. talked about how you had to clear the river channels with the sediment to keep them open to, to flow or they'll fill up with sediment in arid areas so it talks about how that's what we we needed to do all that stuff, grow everything, build temples and all these things. Does right? this happen, are you saying this happens naturally because of how we were programmed or there's also some source communication that happens among some of us that allows us this, again, very meta. Remember but. the whole concept of like fallen angels, that yes. idea? That's it. That's what happened. Is that, Wait, hold on. Stop. Right? I, I want to make sure I understand. Is this getting into like some of the stuff that like Diana Walsh Basolka talks about? Maybe. I don't I don't know her work. Okay, continue. We're not going to go into biblical stuff too much. I'm just going to scratch the surface because it is it is the only way we can understand this. In in uh in Lebanon and in the area of Syria is a place called Mount Hermon. 
Mount Hermon is supposedly where some of these fallen angels in the Book of Enoch came down. Now, the Book of Enoch, for people that don't know, was originally supposed to be a text in the Christian text, the Hebrew Christian text, but it was taken out. What, what's that mount? How do you spell it? Mount Hermon, H-E-R-M-O-N. Oh, spell it wrong, sorry. That's in Syria, you said? It's, a, it's on the border between Syria, Lebanon, and that, that, that region right there. Okay, I'll put that in the corner of the screen for people. So, the point is... These creators did something they weren't supposed to. They supposedly broke these co these universal cosmic laws that exist. Now we're getting deep. I, and I can't... Bro, we got deep a long time ago. <laughs> there are supposedly <laughs> cosmic laws that exist in the universe that they're supposed to adhere to. Which are? Which are... you Creation can only happen if it's based on certain things. They violated creation by... And I hope I don't lose people with this, but they describe how they created us and we were so perfect that some of them had sex with the women. This is where we got into, we get into demi bloodlines. And where are you getting, the, where's, what's the source The book of, of Enoch, the book of Enoch. It discusses in other places, but the book of Enoch pr pr predominantly says they were fallen or they became fallen because they slept with the daughters of men. And that's a Genesis too. That's in Genesis as well. They slept with. How's that in Genesis? It's an. I don't remember the exact passage, but it says in Genesis, uh, it relates to giants and fallen angels. It says they slept with the daughters of men. Man, and men meaning mankind, because we weren't called human beings; we were called mankind. That's what our name is from their text. Is it originally called mankind? So they create a perfect creation. It's so perfect that I mean, literally, as someone who's, a, you know, beautiful women are beautiful. <laughs> they really are. 100%. Okay. I happen to Don't have disagree. one. My wife is very beautiful. Congrats. Um, thank you. And I just, the thing is, they, um, that's what they state, that they literally, some of them came down and bred with some of these beautiful women that, that and then created this abominated bloodline that was like half gods and half humans. And this is what angered in those ancient texts. I told you about some of those, some of these gods falling out of favor with humanity and then putting us into like basically like hell creating hell here on earth yes by creating massive empires and war and structures structuring everything completely different and you know that because when they lowered kingship they started we all we find is that we have these depictions it's incredible there's murals from mesopotamia that show this passing of knowledge it's, this is what it gets deeper and deeper because it's not like we discovered it. it shows that these Anuna beings in like the Asher Bonal Paul library. And, and, and I don't, yeah. do you want to pull it up really quick? Absolutely. Look at um, Asher Bonapal. Asher Bonapal mural. Mural. I will put this in the corner of the screen. Okay. Yep. There it is. There it is right there. And by the way, for people, sometimes today, images? sometimes today, when I'm putting something in the corner of the screen yeah. and I don't get to say it because you're on a roll. You'll be hearing the whoosh sound for people who are unfamiliar with the show and are new. That means look in the corner of the screen because yeah. someone's fucking there. Okay. Um, go down. Go down. Okay. Uh, There's a library right put, oh, no, um, different. Type in Tree of Life at the top. It, Asher Bonapal Tree of Life mural. It'll, you'll Asher find it. Asher Bonapal. Tree of... All right. There you go. Right there. Right there. Okay. This one right click, here? Click that. All right. I'll stick that in the corner Can you the make it bigger? Because I want to I talk about it with you really quick. Yeah. Let's make this blow this fucker up. Let me zoom in. Okay. There you go. I want you to take a look at this for a second. This is describing everything that I'm talking about. That's why I know it seems bizarre, the things that I'm saying, but I want people to understand this represents me studying both tablets and murals and all of this for, for well over 10 years. Is that an eagle at the top? Yes. Son of a bitch. <laughs> all right, go ahead. So, what happened is what you're seeing here see the wings on the two the two outer people yes now look at the two people in the middle that don't have wings you see okay. that yes now look at the hats they're wearing on the two people on the, with the wings with, with horns on their helmets now the people in the middle don't have horns you see that look try to look carefully if you can yes okay the thing, the thing i'm in this, gonna blow this up yes. for a second on the screen sure. so that people want to pause and look but, okay, go ahead. I'm going to make a statement here that's very bold. This is the most impure, important mural that's ever been created in human history. Aggressive. Period. 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 You put a period on the end. This 
it tells us everything. Okay. I broken this down a bunch of times. Your your listeners aren't haven't heard that maybe, so I'm gonna break it down again. Let's do it. Remember in the tablets it says kingship is lowered and it literally is created, right? And everything I just said. In this depiction, and I want to break it down, the two beings on the other end are the Anuna. That's why they have wings, and that's why the horns on their helmets have multiple horns that represent status. They are not like we are. They're not kings. They're they're the beings that we think of as the Anuna, our creators. So the Anuna, though, I'm just thinking yes, symbolism please. as we know it in bullshit modern culture. Yeah. Wings good, horns bad. They have both. Horns are not really bad. That was something that was inverted later. Horns represented status. That's why bulls were used all throughout Egypt. Mm. The bull represented status as power. So, and certain certain symbols throughout history would have very, very strong connotations and meanings behind them. The two most important symbols for power, like strength, were two things. It was the it was um, the horns of a bull, a, a bull itself in Egypt, and a lion. And the lion in Assyria was famous, and you can see uh, depictions of that. They represented strength and power. And so they would depict them in symbols. And the eagle always, always represented war and empire building. It was like a different mindset. Now, in this depiction, you're, you're seeing our two Anuna on either side passing rulership, kingship, to rule over us to two different individuals. Oh. One of them is a king, and one of them is a priest. Which one's the king and which one's the priest? I just need to zoom in really quick. Hold on a second. Okay. The, um, okay. The, uh, this, this image right here, the, the individual on the right of the tree is holding what's called the rod of rulership in his hand. Okay. And that rod of rulership means he's a king. Got and it. then the other, the other individual across from him has, um, has symbols that basically represent uh, spirit, like religion, and, and seeking that uh. aspect of it. It's you. You learn that one's a priest and one's a king. Got it. And what it means is that now, now, notice those two beings with the wings. They're going. They're passing this. You see that? What they're passing is the symbol of the pine cone, and in their hand they have the handbag. Remember Pillar Forty Three and Gobekli Tepe? It's got the same handbag symbol below it. This is what I'm breaking down to mean. Oh, the shit. Anuna. They know all. They know everything in the universe. They are more powerful than we can ever understand. They seem to somehow be related to creation. Do they look, I mean, because I'm looking at this and I'm just basing yes. it off like some other yes. murals I look at. Like to me, comparing it to other murals, they look like humans. Okay. They ha because you see the two, the king and the priest in the middle? Yeah. They emanated them. So that they, the reason they look like that all throughout the Middle East the, with the long beard and, and that's braided was because that was how they physically decided to represent themselves. On murals or physically decided, period? Physically, they can become here. physical, yes. So they have the ability to be physical if they want to. Okay. So they're passing the pine cone behind the head, pineal gland, they're passing the knowledge to the king and the priest for how to rule over humanity. Like literally passing the laws and rules like the Code of Hammurabi, everything. Now, is some of what you're saying right now broken down by people who have broken it? Down no, that because you're reading, I think or is this I'm, all you. I think that my away? depictions of the handbag and pinecone are a little bit different for me, but I think many have echoed the pinecone as 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 what it is and what the okay, pinecone okay. represents yeah, is knowledge because it's the passing the seeds of knowledge. Now, now if you think, uh, if you look at a pinecone, mm. it already has the sacred geometry woven into it. The sacred geometry of the golden ratio, the way that it's designed within the pine cone, has its own sacred geometry woven in. All right, golden On, ratio, back up for a minute. The golden ratio represents the ratio between um, creation of like everything in the universe. So if you look at a shell versus like a human eye versus a flower, they all have this golden ratio design. Right, you've you've heard of that. Yes. It's called the golden ratio. Yes. It represents this, um, and I'm not an expert on this. I'm not. I just happen to know enough to talk about it a little bit. But it relates to the idea that we are. There is a blueprint to the entire universe, where everything is designed based on these patterns and these cycles and rhythms and all these things. And so they chose a pine cone because not only is it based on sacred geometry, which is their their language of the universe. Geometry is the language of yeah. the universe, by yeah. the way. Um, but it was about passing the seeds of knowledge. Like the idea that if you, if you pass it, plant a seed, that the seed can grow into a tree, into something incredible. 
And so they sh would show passing knowledge as, as that to these individuals of everything. They literally would be teaching them everything to rule, but in a way where they were supposed to be like, like powerful in terms of information. Now the handbag represents them having the to totality of all knowledge. So it's like they ta they're taking, and th these aren't real, these are symbols. They're taking these, these pine cones, which is a symbol, out of this bag. But they're not real. Like, neither of them are actually real things. How old, again, are we saying this mural The Ashurbanipal mural of the Tree of Life was found in the same place as that great library of all the tablets. Yes, Because how it, old do we 3, think 3,500 years or, or so ago. So it's far removed from when this would have happened. Yeah. Yes. Now, here's the reason. Because in fairness, let me yeah, just please. point this out as yeah. the layman here yeah. in the room, the only one. But <laughs> when we look at the Bible, yeah. right? It has a lot of great teachings in it. The Quran has a lot of great teachings in it. There's things in the modern yeah, world we I obviously agree. can disagree with. Take yeah. the good, leave some of the stuff that's not there. But just cynically speaking from a truth perspective, mm -hmm. it's a story that you know stretches back, whatever it is, 6,000 years or something. And it was written throughout you know the post bc era the ad era and it was passed down over hundreds of years to yes. form into what it was which means as we've already laid out a million times mm -hmm. today the whispering down the lane kind of thing it, stories turn into more oh, legends that turn yeah, yeah. into whatever yeah so now we're talking about something where you've put a billion yeah. with a b no, on, no, not this isn't a billion years old. No, but, I know. Yeah. But you're saying the history of something like this could stretch back to a billion with a B. Not human civilization. Not human civilization, yes. but the people who allegedly handed off to human civilization. So either way, it's somewhere way back these from 3,500 years. These are Nuna on either side with the wings seem to be related to Earth history at least a billion years ago. Right. Yes. So when I say when when you're telling me the mural drawn is approximately 3500 years old or something that tells me it's a lot of sources removed from where something like this allegedly could well, have happened. Well, but it wasn't made then. It was found then. Or it was it was okay, let me let me clarify something. Please. Ashurbanipal was a king of Assyria. He was a king that was very became extremely interested because he was an unusual king. He was from a later time period in history. It's true. He was only like 3,500 years ago. But he was a king that was also a sage and a priest. Very unusual. And he was studying the ancients of his time. And he has, um, he talked about in some of his um, writings he left behind how um, he wanted to be a different king than every other king. Mm. He wanted to, to do something no one other king had done. And so he wanted to create the greatest library that's ever been amassed in the history of the planet. So it's talked about how he sent out his armies and he was already in, um, he was in Nineveh. That's where this is from. But it's talked about how he sent out armies to everywhere in the old world. So probably Egypt and up to, up to the Turkey area we're in and down to I Iran to, to find and recover every single tablet, cuneiform tablet and bring it back. What years was and he murals again? too. What years was he around again? He was around approximately 3,000 to 3,000 3, 3, 3,500 years ago, depending on sources. Now, this is a real exact question. I don't expect you yeah. to know the answer to this, but I can look it up. Do we have an idea of what the global population size was at that time? We can, we can tell you that he was a rival against the great civilization of Babylon to his south, and that the Babylon had a population of at least 50 to 100,000 people. That's not that big. Okay. Well, no, at least. At, I know, but at that's least not that we big. don't we don't know entirely, but we know that it was the biggest city on Earth at the time. Again, if I was go to Babylon. fucking Cherry Hill, there's I don't know how many right. people. Right. Well, because we have eight billion, billion people on the planet. Right. Now. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's all relative. Yeah. To be clear, yeah. but still, you're talking about you're talking about a limited number of people mathematically searching a rather large plane that has a similar, at least a very similar landmass to what we're dealing with now in that area of the world. All right, keep going. But they I'm knew things we don't know now, right? So imagine they know some of the old ancient stuff and they know kind of where to look better. They, there are understanding of the ancient world has changed a lot in 3,000 years, it, meaning sure. that it was a lot newer for them than it, it is for, for us now. And for him, being an ancient king that had bloodlines back to his father, connections to Sennacherib and these in Tigris, these, these kings that supposedly were ancient, ancient, ancient. He's a bloodline of them.
See, it's, it never changed. Mm. It's the same thing. But he wanted to change history. So he sent out and amassed this Ashurbanipal library. And upon doing that, this depiction is supposed to be of like his great great grandfather. Oh. So this is either Sennacherib or someone related to that. But the point is, this is already super ancient. He's already ancient and he wanted to go find stuff more ancient than him. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yes. And so he amasses, he amasses this. And this was made before, either during his time or before his time. The point is what they're doing is they're trying to take an old understanding and trying to show it in a way where we can understand. It's like, how do you take super complex understanding of something and then just like put it in a mural? I just, in my head, when I hear stuff like this and, and there's nothing, you know, like I want to believe everything and there may be great evidence for everything. Yeah. I just wonder how much the story can change. I know I keep saying it, but you know, we are talking about planes of thousands, tens of thousands, millions, up to a billion years in some cases about some of this. And it's like, could there be a kernel of truth within there or could there be a ton of truth? You can that's, make the argument but for that's both. that's the whole point of where we're about to go. That's like where this is all building up to is what's the truth within that. And that's what I became obsessed with, I would say, was that being like, well, is any of this true? Right? Is any of this true? And the thing was that, again, I want to point out is that we have tablets that were written from much earlier time periods, like, like ancient, ancient, as early as we can get, that later ones basically are saying like almost the same thing, but they're from completely di different yes. time periods in history. That's how you get that clarity of thinking of what might, might be real. Similar argument to the phenomenon with the description of potential okay. beings. and The yeah. point, uh, I guess, Fair. and I didn't necessarily want to get off on that super deep rabbit hole, but we no, did, we good, did and we did what we did. Today. So, Keep going. So the point I'm trying to make is there's things going on here that are like supernatural almost. There's things going on that are beyond our linear comprehension of, of just us here alone with no nothing influencing us at all. And that has to do with the first city ever created. Again, we're going to go all the way back to where we were is that in these tablets, if you'd want to believe anything that we're saying, how about we actually verify with real on the ground places? That's what's so exciting, right? Mm. Now let's take what was theoretical potentially and what was mythical and all these things, which was what everything of this was because it's so ancient, so ancient that now let's try to see if any of that's real. First place to look is that, well, in six different tablets from the Sumerian king list to Eridu Genesis, we get um, what they state is the first city ever created after the Ajiji, and it's called Eridu, E-R-I-D-U. And it's located in southern Iraq, and every tablet, literally everything mentions it being the first. It's not like an in, in question or about one, play, one tablet being somewhere and blah, blah, blah. And they do credit it as being the first city ever on earth, even in mainstream. And you'll see that. So... How many people lived here? We don't have a population, but I can tell you that it's acknowledged as being the first city ever on Wikipedia right there. And yet this site is the greatest conspiracy of any ancient site in the world. Why? It has only been partially excavated between the late 1800s, 1887. And then it was partially excavated again in 1946 and 1948. And then it was abandoned and nothing has happened since. Why? Here's where it gets more wild. When they excavated it and they found Eridu, it must have been a quite a shock to them because remember, myth, not really myth anymore. It was the first one they found. Un a University of Oxford and other groups came there in 1946 and they're like, this really is Eridu. And today there is still in the Oxford University, there is still a section of the library there that has our, some relics from Eridu. With writing and that stuff on them. So why do I say that? Because they found it. They found all kinds of artifacts. But they only excavated the main part of the, the city. But in ancient times, where the people lived is not where the higher-ups lived. So like priests and higher-up people, they never lived together. So what would happen is you'd have a main city below and then always on a prominent mountain. It, uh, sometimes they described it. In, in this case, Eridu is not a natural formation. They described it as actually creating a mountain in the middle of nowhere to be this like standing above everything. So they create this temple called the temple, the ziggurat of Eridu. Okay. And it's this mass, you know what a ziggurat is? Nope. 
Ziggurat is a pyramid, but in Mesopotamia. Okay. It's their version of a pyramid. Got it. Okay. So they make this incredible Ziggurat temple on this mountain that looks over this endless plain with, and then there's, then there's like the little city down below where people live and there's commerce and you know, all that stuff. They get there knowing that they look up and see the ziggurat. Like it's insane. Cause you can look at pictures and I'll go into how I know all this in a second. They get there, they find it. You imagine if, if, if today, right. Imagine if we had uh, a town that had like an incredible museum with all kinds of artifacts and stuff. Would you find any of those artifacts in any other part of the town except the museum? Probably not, right? No, they put it all there. So imagine going there and knowing that 99% of all of the relics and artifacts would be in that ziggurat, in those temples and in those libraries, and you don't even excavate it at all. What? I mean, not at zero. Before I ask why they didn't do that, I misunderstood your first question then. Yes. So why would it only be in those places? Relics. Because you asked as a museum. In, important relics and things would be kept in the temple. Always would be kept in these sacred places. Ancient but there tablets, could be more than one or two, no? The ziggurat was the great temple of Eridu. I know, but couldn't there other, like, St. Patrick's Cathedral is like the great fucking cathedral they in didn't New York do City. That back, it's they not the only church They didn't do that back then. There's none of that. No. Back then, religion was done through the high priest only. In one place? Yes. Okay, continue. So why didn't they excavate So they this? get there. Again, there's literally on display artifacts from Eridu. In in the University of Oxford, so you can squash the whole idea they didn't find anything type of concept, and yes. then that's why, right? They find those artifacts in 1876 or something. But they stopped in 1948. They No, they have a gap where they don't do anything Nothing. for like 40 years. The University of Oxford and this big group comes back as this big expedition. They come back. At the end of World War One. Yes. Okay. And they, they, right? And they find it. And they, they get a ziggurat and all that stuff, and they never come back. Like a memo came down. I'm just, I'm just speculating, but someone made a decision, very powerful. And there's nothing else you can describe this as, because it also pisses religion off too. Because then I'll you bet. get into Enki and the snake and the serpent, remember? So someone made a very powerful decision to literally have this place disappear. But there still seems to be this like old code if I want to describe it as there's an old code with whoever makes these decisions where they can't just destroy something themselves. It's like they have to have someone else do it. I don't know why, but they list, they sort of just left it there, right? It's kind of weird, but they left it in the middle of the desert. And then of course we had Iraq, all the instability in Iraq and everything. And to this day, Eridu has not one fence, not one single piece of infrastructure around it at all. And when I realized that, I went on a crusade called the Campaign to Save Eridu, came, all, various different things, and I was on my website and I started talking all about it on shows, like on Gaia and other shows. And I was took images from people that had gone there, from like Baghdad, who were looting it. Walking around, yeah. Like, and I have so a whole- So it's not even in any way- no, it's, oh my God. And, and I have, and I have all those images on my, on, on one of the videos I did and on different places. And if you look up Eridu, if you just look it up on Google maps, you can find the images. I think they're still there. Cause what I'm, what, as I was scrolling here, listening to that, I'm trying to see like, if there's something on Wikipedia, for example, that mentions like a, a segment that's called like conspiracy or like, or like controversy. And there, I don't really see anything. There's only one little thing that says tablet controversy. It's less, it's less than a full power. I seem to be the only one doing this. And I don't know. There's various reasons for that. So for the skeptic out there yeah. who listens to you and says, well, why is one asshole in fucking Colorado doing this and no one else is? Are you really onto something that no I one don't else is? Think why that, are you onto something? I don't think that anyone is in the mainstream is allowed to touch it. Why would that be? Because this single site, regardless of all the other places we're about to go, can completely change history. And it's like, it's, okay, let me give you an example. Eridu is described as being the first city created before some of these catastrophes came through. Images you can find today on the summit of the ziggurat, this, that, that old temple that's literally so ancient, there's not even any brick or anything left. It's like all of just eroded and there's seashells covering the top of the mountain. Seashells. Meaning water. The ocean that yeah. flooded it. And not only that, 
but we're finding pottery and cuneiform is this what, is tablets. Is this what Ben found? No. No, it's totally different. They're, they're showing these people, and I'm, I'm this, if you can hear my voice, it's sadness. They're showing images of just people that uploaded them from their phone. Okay? I, if you go on Google Maps, yeah. Yeah. go on Google Maps and go just type in Eridu, and then it'll pop up with images. And I don't know if they've all been taken down since, but I will tell you that I noticed that, and other people brought it up on my podcast, that they, they blurred the imagery over Eridu in just one square, too. Come on. I'm not even kidding. So right. uh, click, click that. Click, click this. that. Go down. Look, there's no infrastructure. See, no fences. Keep going. Keep going. I know what I'm looking for, so keep going. Right there. Okay. Right there. This. Uh, you just, right there. Right there. Okay, I'll put this picture in the corner of the screen. There are many, many others. That's just one of about 20 that show people that are not affiliated with, the, with any kind of archaeological institution walking around and just picking up the oldest records of humankind and just stealing them and then selling them in the black market. They realized they were smart too. I got to give them credit. They realized the easiest way to have all this disappear would be to leave it to the wolves. And then I, you want to go deeper? I think that this site is one of many in this region that has so many secrets and uncovers it that the Iraqi war may have been, this may have been a big reason why they did this. The Iraq war? Yes. Not, remember when they did that, all, all structure in this country sort of collapsed in terms of archaeology though. I think I think Dick Cheney wanted to make some money, bro. Well, maybe so, I but I will I tell you, I will tell you that these sites have been completely abandoned. Yeah, that's why I wouldn't say they did the war because of it. I would say it's more your first well, theory about letting the wolves go grab it. But they, f but there was a lot of artifacts that went missing. There was something like two thousand artifacts that went missing after the Iraq War from the museum. See, in Baghdad, in this yeah, is I why, would believe that because it was a shit show. Well, but I am saying, but the thing is, who took them? Because there's images that are that are pretty controversial. No, of the museum, though. Yeah, probably exactly okay, what well, you're looking at here. Regardless, yeah. let me just say that to this day, right now, not only did they blur it out after I started making noise, and I'm not saying it's because of me, but it did get blurred out. Eridu on what Google Maps. What got blurred out? I haven't seen if that If you yet. go to Google Maps. I'm on good. This is Google no, Maps. No, no, go to the actual map. Okay, here's the map. Click the X on that. The X pull on? Up, pull up this. Satellite. Yeah. Now zoom out. Okay. Now zo zoom out. And then what you're going to find is go to the nearest area around it that has good clear imagery. And as you work your way in, you're going to see it just goes blurry. Where? So like, Tell me. Go over here. They zoom over there. Right there? Yeah. Where those hills are right there. Right here. Zoom in. Zoom in. Now, now stop. No, no. Don't go in that far. Go out a little bit. Go out a little bit. Just out a bit. Now go that way and just watch. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. Son of a right bitch. there. That was not there two years ago. Or a year. Wait, what is this? Hold on. It's they changed the imagery. Only for the square around Eridu. Because you can't see anything now. So what and so I know look, this is, I just zoomed out. It's this area right here. It's like almost like a shaped like a weed bowl kind of. Well, it's all nice all out there. So if you go if you go look anywhere in there, it's clear imagery. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. This is all nice. I'm yeah. saying this see this one spot right here that we just zoomed yeah, in on? Yeah. This is where it changes, right there. Right? So Be what is that? Now go this way. Keep going this way. It's the axis to Eridu. There's, a, there's an axis point right here. It goes, it goes down. It goes off into the desert, and it's an axis point to Eridu. They blurred it out on Google Images. But they, hold on a minute. This doesn't... What do you mean it's blurred out? It's they cha changed it's weird. the imagery into one that's got less, much, much less uh, character um, definition. It's... So if, well, that's the thing. It doesn't, they look, one is dark and one is bright, but it doesn't look like much changed on the ground. It still looks like, it looks like someone put exposure on the other and someone had I, Well, less I can tell you that other. if you try to go zoom in an Eridu right now and go look, you can't really see So you anything. want me to zoom in right here? No, this way. No, but this is what we're talking, why would I go oh, over here? Well, to see the comparison. So zoom in right here and look at how clear it is. Just look at Yeah, like, it's clear in this one area. This is the only area, but this is the only area on the whole map where it's like that. That's my point. I'm saying is a year and a half ago, the colorization and what it looks like around Eridu wasn't there. It was, it was, it was much, much clearer. And I like know that, that was. Yes. And I know but that. But hold on a minute. Because I save minute. screenshots and images on my computer. Hold on a minute. I'm going to be a huge skeptic okay. on this. Because the entire area around here... 
the whole state, the whole country is the same color as Eridu. You're too far zoomed out. But yeah, but I know. Look, this is the only, if anything, you should be saying what the fuck is going on in this spot. Not like, oh, this is what it all used to be like because this spot is different and may, and it looks like this line right here. And I'm going to put some of this in the corner. It's a little hard because we're navigating a map and I, I don't have like live screen recording of this stuff. But this this little area, I don't know how big it is, but it's not that big, has all the, has like a straight deductive or like, or I should, I'm sorry, arbitrary line that makes it bright as if there's like clouds here and suns here. No, that here. square used to be way bigger is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but why is, so if it was way bigger though, who's to say it's on Eridu versus on all these Saeed, Ket, Garol, Jahar, see this, You see this Al lake? You see this lake right here? Hamar Lake? Yes. It's this entire region. All I can tell you is that the imagery looked completely different a year and a half ago in a way where you could see very direct things on the ground at Eridu. And you can go there right could now. Could you do the yellow man and drop it? Well, just... just Because there's no roads. I'm, I'm going to... Go in. I can just show you right where it is. Go over here. By the oh, lake. Down this way. Down. Right there. Eridu. Zoom into that. Zoom in. It's, the imagery is horrible now. Listen, I worked. I don't. You don't. So know. you're telling me I could have dropped this yellow man here a year ago? Yes. Now I want to give you background because you need Stop to know this. Drop. I worked for a mapping company for 13 years. Okay. A mapping company. Mapping company means I exclusively dealt with using imagery, satellite imagery, and basically looking at things on the ground versus reality. Okay. I was like an expert on that, and so when I started playing with this, and I started showing Eridu detailed, zoomed in, I went back whatever how many months later and the imagery had changed and not in a way where it was updated to be better and people commented on my channel and said hey did you did you see eridu now you can't even see it anymore a bunch of people did and it's just it's a really weird thing because it just happened i just but there's no roads here and the way i've always because i am not an expert mapper yeah. like you let's be very clear about that but i use google maps like every other asshole yeah. out there the, in my experience, the yellow man gets dropped when there's like a road. And some roads in the world obviously like don't have it. You can't even drop it. So you're telling me that a year ago I could have dropped that on that. No, yellow, the yellow man refers to street view on the ground. Yes. There's never been street view So there's here. never been street view. So I don't understand what the big fucking deal is. Okay. Satellite imagery. Some of us study using looking at satellite imagery to uncover ruins. You can see signatures. Zoom into Airdrie right now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like what can't you see here? I don't understand. That's what I'm trying to show you. That... What's what's wrong with this? The details of the way it used to look, you could see super clarity of both the ziggurat as well as the town around it, and now it's blurry. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, so let me go, hold on. Let me go to another, I'm going to zoom all the way out. And this part may not be in the corner of the screen, people. Sorry, I'm going to go to Baghdad, a little above Baghdad, outside the city. Okay? okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can't say everywhere is the same imagery, though. I can't use by, that as a basis. Yeah, this is by Dolama. Maybe. Do, what does that say right there? What's that? D-O... Dojama. Dojama. D-O-J-A-M-A. -A. Yeah. Just, I'm marking that for myself later. Look at this. Okay. So I'm going to go look at... These look like some fields those are and farm, shit. Those are, those are fields for farming. They're different crops. All right. Here we go. This is more... There's, there's, a, there's a line right there that you can see too. See there's, it? Right yeah, here? that's what it, Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. I don't think this has anything to do with Eridu. This is all, this is I, at a random spot I just picked on the map. I, all I'm saying is that the clarity on your left side versus your right was there a year, less than a year ago. I think that's random, bro. Okay, I really it, do. It's fine. I don't I'm, think all that's I'm like, saying you know, is someone at like Google headquarters that, is like the ancient Anunnaki Okay, but this site is also the oldest city on earth and it's been abandoned by archaeologists and not touched at all. How do you, can you explain that? That I could, that's a okay. that's a separate issue. They want this place to disappear off the face of the earth. So you mentioned you mentioned they find it at, around the area of like 1875, 1878. They don't do anything on it. They come back to it at the end of they World War I. They only excavate the main, yeah, the main city, not the ziggurat. Okay. So they start working on that, and they have, you can see that. And then what happens is they come back. In 1918. And they have 1946 to 1948. Wait, you, wait, wait. What happened in 1918, though? You just skipped ahead. 
Because you said they found it in like I'm just trying 18, to keep you straight. 18, 1870 or, or right. 1880. They you started. said forty. This um, we're from earlier. You said forty years later, end of World War II. They came there. They didn't really do a hell yes. of a lot. Yes. They leave again. Yes. They come back now in 1946 and 1948. They come back in 1940. Nothing happened in between, as far as I know. They come back in 1946, 1948, and there's images on the University of Oxford site of them like walking around. They're not, they don't do any excavation. They're like walking around looking at it. Okay. And, and you can actually see images on this from that. And they're walking around and then they never come back ever again. Who's walking around? The University of Oxford. Yeah, and, but do we and know I, who? No, I don't, okay. I don't have that information. But okay. I know that the, the uh, Iraqi Museum and the University of Oxford are the primary two that are there. The, wait, the Iraqi Museum, refresh me on that. Back in 1946, the Iraqi Museum was doing archaeological digs in Iraq. Including in this spot? They were, yeah, they were working with the University of Oxford to find Eridu. The whole point was they were like trying to see if this, the early stories had any merit. Now, my Iraq history is terrible pre-1980. like So, who's in charge of Iraq at this time? I don't remember off my head. Okay. I'm just trying to think of that. I'm, I'm trying to find some links here. Because we know Britain was all over these goddamn yeah. areas. As far as I was concerned, I don't think they were, had control of Iraq or anything. No. But, huh. So, Iraq, again, a myth, gets found and then only partially excavated and then they abandon the site. Never even excavate the temple. It'd be like going to Giza Plateau in Egypt and excavating like a little thing in front of the pyramid and not going to the pyramid. That's what this <laughs> yeah. would be like. Yeah. Okay? That makes sense. So, they... They go to there, they abandon the site, and nobody returns ever again. As far as I know, no archaeologist has stepped foot there in, like, over 70 years. As far as you know. There has been no documentation online of any excavations that are being done in Eridu at all, let okay. alone any, any, all the images that are up to date from this year or last year clearly show there's no infrastructure. Again, like I said, there's more images than just you saw. And you can see people that are just regular people walking around the ziggurat and just finding tablets sticking out of the ground and just taking them and going and leaving. Now, yeah, you already know how I feel about the closed-end world that can be academia with this stuff. I okay. made that very clear. Yeah. Yeah. It's not positive. Let's try to play devil's advocate. Okay. And let's let's try to come up. The or, area is or unstable. Are there, are there reasons? The able the area is unstable. It's dangerous, so we can't go back and excavate. That's probably, Why would it be dangerous? I'm giving that hypothetical excuse they might say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Why it's would it the, be dangerous? It's exactly. Dangerous they, for us to find so then they better. create the instability and then allow <laughs> looters to steal everything, so it disappears through, for history. And again, to go to the beginning, just to wrap up the bow on this, what in finding that. What is so dense about it that would make it absolutely change history other than changing the timeline of when humanity was first here? And you can bring that as part of the Talks about the Anuna gods. Um, Talks about the creation of civilization. Talks mm -hmm. about that things started different than we're told. It would change our entire understanding of all of history. Eridu is, is, Eridu is a piece that fits into a much bigger puzzle that we're about to uncover that we haven't even done yet. We're just started. I know we're already like hours and hours in. But this, I'm building off of something way, much, much more significant than just this. This is like the beginning of something greater we're about to go over. Mm -hmm. It's a story that has been deliberately hidden so that we don't know it ever exists. And so that we think it's a myth and it's not real. All right, guys, that takes us to the end of part one of my conversation with Matt LaCroix. That's right. We have a whole second part coming for you. Matt and I are going to get into everything Eridu as well as the pyramids and much more. You are not going to want to miss it. So if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button as well as the bell button so that you get notified when the new episode comes out. If you haven't liked this video, please do that as well. And I'll see you guys next week.